trail and ultra runners what is going on what's happening welcome to another episode of the coop cast as always i am your humble host coach jason coop and on the podcast today we try to answer one of the most long-standing and misunderstood issues in ultra running today and that is sodium supplementation This is an area of ultramarathon nutrition where I see coaches and athletes constantly screwing it up, and that is for very good reason. Sodium balance is a complex interplay where you need three starting variables, your starting blood sodium, how much you are sweating, and the sodium concentration of that sweat to determine how much fluid and sodium you're actually going to replace. It is not as simple as take one salt pill per hour, which is what you will see on many of the nutrition products out there today. Fortunately, today's guest, repeat offender, Dr. Alan McCubbin out of Monash University and the founder of Next Level Nutrition, he sharpened up his graphing calculator and algebra skills just enough to present a new model of how and under what conditions we should be supplementing with sodium. His new paper, which you can find in the European Journal of Sports Science, is titled Modeling Sodium Requirements of Athletes Across a Variety of Exercise Scenario. And variety of exercise scenarios is actually really important in ultra running. Identifying when to test and target or season to taste. A link to that paper is going to be in the show notes. This is a pragmatic view of the entire complexity of the problem. After speaking with Alan and during this podcast, one thing struck out to me more than any other, and that is because of the duration of most ultra running races, we can supplement during those races drastically different than what we do in training. And this fundamentally breaks the don't do anything new on race day paradigm that we are so accustomed to. I want each of you listening to think about that as we discuss Alan's model. Additionally, I have a treat for all you listeners at the end of this podcast. I pulled together a group of our coaches and we discussed exactly what this means for each of our athletes and each of you listening. And we did this just like we would do in one of our typical coach education roundtables. This is a request that I have been belabored with since the inception of this podcast. And if I'm being honest, I've been reluctant to pull it into form. Oftentimes, our continuing education sessions, they either contain sensitive athlete information, which we can't broadcast to the public, or the context is just a little bit too much inside baseball. It's just not the right format to bring to a wider audience. But I thought that this topic in particular was nuanced enough and important enough to use our coach continuing format to give it additional context. So stick around after Alan and I's discussion where coaches Duncan Callahan, Ryan Anderson, Nicole Rasmussen, and Frederick Sabator Pastor, all of which who have made previous appearances on the podcast. And in Fred's case, he was actually a guest where we talked about some of his research. We have an unfiltered coach roundtable that honestly, it's pretty much exactly how we would do it if the mics weren't rolling and I thought it was pretty cool. So let me know what you think about that particular format after you listen to it in its entirety. All right, that's enough. That's too long of an intro for now. I'm getting right out of the way. Here's my conversation with Alan McCubbin and a subsequent conversation with our coaches all about sodium supplementation. I'm always... um... I'm always excited to do podcasts like this because I, I firmly believe in the people that have kind of followed my content and also the, the, our coaching staff will, 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 they'll definitely back me up on this comment. I've always thought that fluid and hydration and sodium, the confluence of all of those is one of the biggest drivers of ultramarathon performance. And you combine that with the fact that it's very dynamic. In the, mm. in the sport application that we have, because we have a huge temperature range that can happen with any, within any one competition, not just one competition to mm. the next. Like if you look at the Olympics, they all know it's going to be hot on the Olympic marathon course, like before, because they can look at the average temperature ranges mm. and things like that. But if you look at ultra marathon and especially the longer ultra marathons, you go through this huge range of temperatures. So that adds in another point of complexity to this whole fluid balance equation. And then you have this history, which you're very well aware of where 
we look at, you know, the drink to thirst versus drink on a schedule wars or battles or even the position statements, right, that the ACSM mm. has, uh, uh, has put out. You combine that with this, with the kind of the cultural sodium supplementation that has gone on within the ultramarathon uh, world specifically, and it just creates this like incomprehensible kind of goulash of, of, of factors that athletes and coaches have to weed through. And I think those two things combined, the fact that it has such a, such a huge implication on performance and the, the dynamic of how fluid and sodium supplementation uh, plays out during an ultra marathon race, you combine those two things, uh, you combine those things together. And I really think that we can't talk about this enough as coaches and, 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 and athletes out there. So I'm always really excited to, 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 to bring you on board, whether, whether we end up muddying those waters even more and confusing people more or adding a little bit of clarity, I think remains to be seen, but not, but nonetheless, I always like talking about it because I do think that every time we chip away at better answers, um, mm. and, and I've experienced that during the course of my coaching career, where initially if we thought we had good answers and then five years later, we revise those and five years after that, some other wrinkle gets added to it. And then five years after that, another wrinkle gets to it. What I appreciate about your paper that we're going to talk about and uh, what I mentioned, what I mentioned off air is that this is math that I think everybody has wanted to do, but nobody's taken a crack at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so, so kudos to you for taking a crack at it. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's interesting. Like, the, the genesis of, I guess, me having a crack at that was, you know, doing some work in the lab with athletes and, you know, looking at sodium replacement there and getting these values and going, well, you know, even when we're not giving them sodium, their blood sodium concentrations are going up. And, you know, we know that if you don't drink anything, that will happen. But these guys were drinking stuff and their blood sodium was still going up even before we gave them any sodium. And then it was sort of going back and going, okay, well, how do we... You know, and then I tried to come up with sort of models of, okay, well, how much sodium do we need to replace during exercise? Clearly, it's not 100% because we're, you know, we're just sending their, their plasma sodium through the roof. But, you know, how much is it? Is it 0%? Is it 50%? Is it 100%? And how do we define that, you know, numerically? And, and so that's what sort of brought me out of the lab. And I guess during COVID when we couldn't do research, it kind of helped as well to to look at the mathematics of it and i guess the first thing i'd say is that you know the equations here are not my own work um this is taking equations that have existed since 2003 uh, originally come from clinical medicine but then they were validated during exercise by the guys at the gay raid sports science institute but they were doing it uh, to predict people's blood sodium at the end of exercise given the fluid ins and outs and the sodium ins and outs whereas i just used some high school algebra to flip that equation so the thing on the left of the equal sign is the sodium intake part rather than the final blood sodium. So it basically says, well, if we want our blood sodium at the end of exercise to be the same as it is at the start, and we've got a certain amount of fluid ins and outs and a certain amount of sodium loss, and there's potassium in that equation as well, but it makes a pretty small difference to the, the overall result. How much sodium do you need to achieve that result? And so, yeah, it's just taking an existing equation and looking at it in a different way to answer a practical question. It's amazing how far high school algebra will take you in these oh, scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> I had to think back a bit to uh, work it all out. Uh, hi, so shout out to all the high school uh, algebra teachers. Mine was Gail Nobles. Yeah. I remember her very, very fondly. <laughs> but yeah, those tools, those tools go a long, long, long way. Mm. Okay, so the paper that the paper that we're talking about, there'll be a link in the show notes for listeners to go and reference this if you want to. It's it's not a it's not a bad paper to read. It's open access, right? Because I have a copy of this. Or did you send me the copy? I think I sent it to you. Yeah, okay. I don't think it is open access. Okay, so it might not be it might not be open access, but the paper, if you want to look at it, the title of it is is modeling sodium requirements of athletes across, and I'm going to emphasize this intentionally, a variety of exercise scenarios. And I think that that point is particularly taken with the ultramarathon audience, because that is one of the scenarios that you modeled across. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the strengths of all the math that you applied, because it shows, it really demonstrates how dynamic or how different the, the strategy that you can deploy actually is depending upon the, the the inputs, all of the inputs of one of which is an ultra marathon uh, uh, scenario. So that's the title of the paper. The links to that will be in the show notes, but we're going to start out by going for the jugular. 
So the uh, the audience might precipitously drop off after this next couple of minutes because we're going to give everybody not the answer, but we're going to give them the major themes to start out with and then back into the caveats and the details behind those themes behind it to really arm the athletes with, okay, because you are going to have to come up with this is what I'm going to do on race day based on all of these scenarios. Mm -hmm. But I want to start out with that just to start to paint the picture of really what is, what are we talking about and what is realistic and what are these general kind of guiding principles? So we're going to focus in initially on the ultra marathon side of things. Yep. So describe to the listeners this context that you started to put around that you started to put around how much sodium supplementation is actually needed or necessary in most of those situations yeah well the first part i guess when we try and work out you know how much sodium do you need during exercise and that's been a huge gap in our guidelines you know there's been a lot of research working on how to work out exactly how much you lose but very little in terms of well okay once you quantify that how much of that should you replace right. I, I guess i sort of went back to square one and said well why are we replacing sodium what are we actually trying to achieve by doing that and so you go through and look at all the different reasons that people have given historically for why you want to take sodium during exercise and it might be around fluid absorption although the literature suggests that it has very little impact on that across the entire gut. Uh, you look at things like cramping and the literature suggests that, you know, sodium may play a very minor role, but probably it's not the major role for mo most people. Um, Can you, you repeat look... that? Can you repeat that again? <laughs> yeah. So, so cramping is, is a really, I think where our understanding has sort of come to now is it's a very yeah. complex multifactorial, similar to gut issues during exercise. There's lots of different causes. They're probably different causes for different people. They can be more than one cause happening in the same person at the same time. And so by eliminating one thing at a time, you don't actually figure out what's going on. Um, and sodium plays a very tiny part in that much bigger picture. Okay. I just wanted to emphasize that point since yep. it, it is always a, even though like we're, when we're in the field, we don't think it's that contentious anymore, but it's mm. Wednesday. I do this, ask me anything on Instagram on Wednesday. I still get that question every single week Yeah, and I'll continue yeah. to get that for the next two or three years. So anyway. yeah. Okay, yeah. continue, continue. Yes. So so there are some of the reasons that people give of why you replace sodium. And then you get to the, you know, managing blood sodium concentration. So, you know, hyper or hyponatremia. So hyper meaning high, high blood sodium, hyponatremia meaning low blood sodium. Now, hyponatremia, I guess, is the one that's kind of brought up as the big scary thing that people are really worried about could put you in the medical tent or hospital potentially in some cases, um, although that is relatively rare, thankfully. The, the issue with hyponatremia is usually excessive fluid because it's the fluid buildup in the lungs and in the brain that actually, you know, the hyponatremia, the low blood sodium drives the fluid into our cells, but you've got to have the fluid in the cells to cause the problem. So low blood sodium without a fluid excess seems to be not so much the issue. You have to have the fluid excess as well to, to have that sort of clinical condition that, that we see in, in some events. Uh, so, and then I guess the final thing is sort of flavor fatigue, you know, that, just getting sick of sweet things all the time and you know having sodium to drive thirst to make you want to drink more or just because it tastes better and you're more likely to consume your your sources of carbohydrate and things so they're kind of the reasons that you might want to replace sodium during exercise and then i guess then the next stage is to look at okay well which of those actually requires a specific amount that you might want to go and test for work out your losses and then replace whatever and we'll get into that shortly how much of that you need to replace and really you know obviously the taste side of things is well, i call that season to taste it's based on your personal preference it's got nothing to do with your sweat losses so you don't need to do a sweat test to work out whether a drink tastes good or not um, likewise in terms of you know driving thirst maybe a little bit but probably not so much so it's really around managing the blood sodium concentration is seems to be the one where actually testing your sodium losses and then replacing a certain amount in some situations might be worthwhile and so that's i guess the genesis of, of this paper and i guess if we skip straight to the conclusion from that i guess the main thing is that sodium replacement is really about balancing fluid replacement 
and it's having those two things in sync that seems to be important. And so it's very difficult. You, you really can't plan the sodium replacement based on a sweat sodium test unless you know what you're doing with your fluid replacement because it's the mismatch between those two that causes the problem rather than a deficit in one or the other per se as far as sodium is concerned. And this is what makes it, this is why I call it dynamic, right? Mm. Because it's not just one single variable that you're controlling for. You're really controlling for, for, for three variables all at the same time, all of which, well, some of which change depending upon the environment that you're, yep. that you're, that, that, that you're actually experiencing. But the, the, the picture that you portrayed, not only in the paper, but in some of the accompanying slides that you sent me earlier is that. I'm gonna. I want to make sure I get my vocabulary right. So please forgive. Or so please correct me if I if, if if I'm misstating here. That sodium supplementation is only critical. And I'm emphasizing that word intentionally because I want to distinguish between critical and 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 possibly ergogenic, or at least mm -hmm. mitigating performance decline might be a better way to might be a lot of a better way to put it. If you have large sweat losses in the four to five liter range. That's a mm -hmm. lot. That's a couple, you know, a couple hours, three hours worth of activity for normal people, normal circumstance. You can replace most of it and you have an above average sweat sodium concentration. If Correct. you meet all three of those and you've hit like the loser lottery, you know, <laughs> so to speak, meaning you have like this, this like trifecta of things going on that, that begins the conversation of we need to supplement with sodium outside of that. Meaning if you do not have large sweat losses and you can replace a lot of it or you do not have an above average sweat sodium concentration there's likely little or no need to replace any any sodium that you lost or supplement with sodium and the example in one of the tables in the uh uh in the in the paper that that kind of struck out to me the most is your ultra marathon example where you have a certain combination of those variables and i'll let you explain that where that athlete running a hundred mile ultra marathon needs no additional sodium to avoid getting to a critical level, which is actually possible. I mean, you go back in literature and you can find this, it wouldn't be a unicorn of a person or a unicorn of a situation. It'd actually be not relatively common, but you could find it in, in, in a group of individuals. So describe that more in detail because there are going to be a lot of athletes that are sitting on the other end of this podcast going but wait a minute you know i see salt supplements on every single table at every single aid station and all i've been told is is i have to replace the salt that i actually lose and you're kind of turning that off on its head and saying no it's only underneath these conditions yeah yeah and i think this comes back to i guess again why are we replacing the sodium and what we're trying to achieve by doing that so i guess people have traditionally thought of sodium i think almost like glycogen or what glycogen yes. in a way like you mm -hmm. lose a certain amount of it during exercise and therefore it needs to be replaced because yeah. if we lose too much something bad's going to happen kind of thing whereas you know sodium exists as a concentration within our fluid in the body and that has really big implications obviously with hyponatremia that's one example of where where that goes wrong um but you know it's it stimulates or not the kidneys to either pee out fluid or to retain it it stimulates or not our sense of thirst and our desire to drink it also controls the shift of fluid between the inside of our cells and the outside of our cells so if we are just trying to sort of quote unquote prevent a, like a whole body sodium deficit in that way that we kind of think of glycogen but we ignore its relationship with water, then we can start to get into trouble because we can either over supplement sodium or completely under supplement sodium and, and the balance between our water replacement and our sodium replacement gets out of whack. And then that has all those sort of implications in terms of over or under hydration or you know, fluid shifts into or, or out of the cells uh, during exercise. So yeah, that's I guess the the main sort of crux of it, but yeah, I think people still get nervous going, well, oh, but my test says I have, you know, a 1500 milligram per hour sodium loss. And it's like, well, yeah, you might. And yes, you are losing a lot of sodium. The problem is if you're not replacing enough fluid to require sodium replacement and you take that sodium to chase that loss, but not the fluid loss, 
you end up with a sky high blood sodium concentration. You're going to feel awful. You're going to be terribly thirsty. You might get nauseous and you're not going to be in a great state. So a lot of people, when they argue, oh, but I, I take sodium during my exercise and I feel so much better. Therefore it must be important. I would probably say, well, maybe because it's also then, you know, stimulating your thirst and actually making you drink more. And it's, it's actually, you know, being better hydrated that's having a big impact on that that feeling of feeling better during exercise just to give you a bit of an example of what that looks like because i know people get really skeptical about this when they kind of first hear it right. and this was an example i did this is an iron man example but it could be the same for ultra running so it was a 10 hour example and you have someone with a, a 1200 mils per hour sweat rate a very high sweat sodium concentration 60 millimoles per liter is high for a whole body value uh, and you drink uh, about 80 percent of that water back again but you go out and go well but i lost all this sodium i'm going to replace 100 percent of my sodium losses so over the 10 hours you lose about 16 and a half thousand milligrams over that total which is about probably 20 to 25 percent of all the sodium in your body has gone uh, and then you've lost about 12 liters of fluid, 1200 mils an hour, obviously over 10 hours, which if you drank nothing would be a 17% body mass loss. Now, clearly you are going to drink something. Right. So that's never actually going to happen, but that's what would happen. So then you go out and you, you drink, as I said, you know, 80% of your fluid losses back again. So you end up in about a 3.6% percent body mass deficit, which is pretty reasonable, I think, for, for an Ironman type event. but yeah, you've replaced 80% of the water, but you've replaced 100% of the yes. sodium because you did this sweat test and said, oh, I need to hit this number. So you take all of that, you don't end up with any total body sodium deficit, but your blood sodium concentration, which started exercise at 140 millimoles per liter, which is kind of in the middle of the normal range, is now 155 millimoles per liter. Right. Because what you've done is you've lost water and sodium in your sweat. You've replaced some of the water, but all of the sodium, you've over replaced the sodium during exercise. And he I like, okay, brilliant example. And I'm going to tack on to that with practically how this actually how this actually unfolds. It's completely rooted in the fact that fluid is harder to take in than sodium, because it compromises more volume, right? You're talking about somebody trying to replace 70% of 180 of, of one point would you say 1.2 uh, liters or 1.8 liters 1.2 uh, an hour yeah yep. what, yeah that's a lot of that's a lot of freaking fluid that's hard mm. to take in with everything else that you're taking in all the food and carbohydrates and things like that sodium per unit volume right little pill right little mm. pill you can take in you can get a couple hundred milligrams in it doesn't take it doesn't take a lot i guess is what i'm saying and mm. so the balance that most that that most people go through and this happens a lot in the ultra marathon world is since it is so hard to take in fluid because they're because of the volume dependency of what you are trying of the percentage that you are trying to replace i'm trying to be really careful here with my language you can't you can't guess is just is just so much larger and so much hard like more like literally more difficult to ingest mm. then the small amount of volume that you're trying to replace on the sodium side it's very easy to get to 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 get out of balance yeah and the other problem is that you know when we produce sweat in our sweat glands obviously there's the fluid in there and then there's the sodium component and a few other bits and pieces in much smaller quantities but our sweat glands have the ability to reabsorb some of that sodium back into the body. So when the sweat is first made at the base of the sweat gland, it basically reflects what's floating around in the blood and what we call the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid that's sort of in the space between the cells and our blood vessels. And so that's at 135 to 145 millimoles per liter. And so the initial sweat that's produced at the base of the gland is that sort of concentration. But as the sweat goes up the sweat gland, some of the sodium and the chloride gets reabsorbed back into the body. And so the final sweat sodium concentration on the skin surface for a whole body, because it's different in, in different parts of the body, is typically between about 20 and maybe 70, 75 millimoles per liter. So what that basically means is from that initial sweat that was produced, somewhere between sort of 45 and 85 percent of that sodium is actually kept or well, you know restored back into the body and it never actually leaves the body but all of that fluid leaves so you're losing yes you're losing water yes you're losing sodium but you're losing proportionally more water compared to sodium and that's why when we exercise 
if we don't take anything at all, no drinks, no sodium, no nothing, our blood sodium concentration will go up because yes, we're losing both, but we're losing more water relative to sodium. And, and from you know, a physiological point of view, that makes sense because when that goes up, we get thirstier. So we want to drink to replace that fluid and that'll bring it back down. So it's a perfectly normal kind of well-designed mechanism from an evolutionary point of view. But it then means that, yeah, if you're replacing the fluid, you know, relative to sodium, it's, it's going to be much greater in terms of importance. Well, here's how this is going to practically, practically work out. I did not plan this this way. By, by the way, for the audience, this just sprung up upon me. So if you guys think that this is like some sort of master plan, it was not, and Alan can back me up because this is not, not in our outline. But there are going to be, for those of you that are watching the YouTube version, there are going to be wearables that start to come out. I just happen to have mm -hmm. one on my desk right now. This is a, a NYX patch. It's one of the new players on the market. It looks like one of the continuous glucose monitors. You slap it on your arm and it tells you within a reasonable degree of accuracy, your sweat rate and your electrolyte concentration, which we can kind of extrapolate to, to, to sodium concentration. My fear is the tendency is going to be to look at that and say one for one, everything. Mm. And what, what Alan just went through and what this paper very, very elegantly, although with a lot of math man handling <laughs> demonstrates is that you still need to apply some sort of thought to the thought process. And the biggest one is, is how much fluid are, are you actually replacing to make sure that everything is in balance? That's yeah. my fear with, that's my fear in general with the wearables is that we're taking them in, as a one-to-one -one for whatever it is, glucose, sodium, hydration or whatever it is. And usually there's another variable that's, that's that, that this is not capturing or you're trying to capture in another different mechanism. I was, I was just reminded that their app actually asks you to, to, to input how much fluid you're taking in. But my point of it is, is you can't just take that information and say, just like, you know, glycogen as your example was earlier, say, I'm just going to replace things one-to-one -one because you have, there are other variables in the equation. Mm. Totally. And, and I mean, from a fluid point of view, this is where I think it gets interesting and then it will kind of further go on to relate to the sodium replacement. But from a fluid point of view, if we think about traditionally how we think about hydration, you know, we're trying to pre prevent a, you know, a certain percentage of body mass loss. And you can argue all day long whether that should be 1%, 2%, 5%, whatever it is. Um, you could probably put an argument that, you know, the, the longer, uh, like slightly lower intensity events, maybe you can get away with a bigger percentage body mass loss but that's almost impossible to study so yeah, <laughs> we don't really yeah. have an answer it's more of a hypothesis but I guess if, if I give an example of that if we calculated someone's percentage body mass loss and we were trying to limit them to a, a total body mass loss of two kilos so rather than doing a percentage just two kilos of body mass loss so let's imagine two scenarios one someone goes and runs a half marathon and it's a pretty warm day, obviously half marathon, the pace is pretty high. So your sweat rate is going to be high because you're producing a lot of body heat. And so over the half marathon, you know, hour, hour and a half, whatever it is, you lose two liters of fluid. So you lose your two kilos. So how much fluid do you need to consume to limit your body mass loss to two kilos? Well, zero, because you only yeah. lost two kilos. Yeah. So you need 0% fluid replacement in that scenario. Now let's go to the other extreme an ultra marathon. So let's use 20 hours as a neat kind of a number. So you, oh, sorry, 20 liters of fluid loss as a neat number. So you lose 20 liters of fluid over the, the course of your ultra marathon and you're trying to limit your body mass loss to two kilos. So how much fluid do you need to replace? Well, 18 kilos or 18 liters. So you still got the same deficit overall, <laughs> same, you know, Hydration wise, your total body water deficit is the same in both scenarios, but in one, you replaced 0% of your fluid losses. In the other one, it was 18 out of the 20 liters. So that's 90% fluid replacement. So I guess the key thing here is the greater the cumulative uh, sweat loss, and it doesn't matter whether it's because of duration, because of sweat rate, or the combination of those two factors, the more total sweat in liters you lose, the closer to 100% replacement you need to go. Now, you never actually get to 100%, but you get closer. And if you plot the curve, you see a steep rise for the first sort of three, four, five kilos or liters of sweat loss. And then it sort of almost plateaus out, but just gets inches ever closer to that 100% mark. And how much you need to replace in an ultra marathon situation relative to the total has been the subject of 
of, of many, many debates I talked about on your podcast and mm. we'll link that up. I don't think we quite know the answer to that. You know, no. I, I think we could say it's not a hundred, right? Yeah. Because we, we know there are, there are non, you know, uh, non water losses or non body water losses that, that occur. And you certainly don't want to, don't want to replace more than that. But outside of this, this is a little bit of a guessing game. And some of it comes back to where on the ergogenic versus trying to stay out of a critical situation are you actually are are, mm. are you actually sitting and I, I don't want to talk about that a little bit because a lot of your paper in the accompanying slides talk talks about staying out of this critical blood sodium range right so mm. you're pre, you're kind of preventing people from going to the hospital or having some sort of some sort of uh some sort of catastrophe why did you why did you tend why did you intentionally tend to frame it like that as opposed to here's how we can like optimize performance with this very specific blood sodium concentration that we can aim at because you can certainly aim the math at that specific point so why did you choose choose to do that yeah so i guess there's two parts to that the paper kind of does look a little bit at both because when it models the fluid replacement in the three different exercise scenarios it models fluid at around that two percent body mass loss and when I say 2% body mass loss, it's not literally the body mass before and after. It's a fluid loss, specifically fluid loss, equivalent yeah, yeah. to 2% of body mass. As you said, obviously, in, in ultra, there's other body mass losses that you have to account for. Um, and so the sodium is aimed at maintaining a stable blood sodium concentration for, I guess, what we would consider the ideal fluid replacement, whatever that is, however we'd want to define that. And as you said, that's still controversial. And particularly in ultra, we don't really have a good grasp on that and so that that's kind of how the, the sodium side of it was built i mean we don't have any suggestion or any evidence or, or ideas or suggestions that a particular blood sodium concentration is going to be more ergogenic than mm -hmm. another as long as it's within the normal range and so all of that modeling data was basically looking at the, the start and end blood sodium being 140 millimoles per liter which is like smack bang in the middle of quote unquote, the normal clinical range. And that's what I was kind of getting at is we don't know that is it slightly more optimal to be at 145 or 135 or whatever. There's no data to indicate that any of that is any better than the other. And I've always taken that as a cue when you don't know that is you just get it close, right? Whenever you're doing yep. your real application sports modeling and you have this kind of range of th this, th this range that you can be in of whatever you're trying to target, it's not worth slicing that hair any finer. You just get it close from a pragmatic standpoint and then call it good and then realize that performance is multifactorial. There's going to be other things that get thrown into the mix. Yeah. And I think if we look at the data that has been done to date on sodium and performance, and none of it is in the ultra space just because it's so difficult to do, you know, in a lab setting or, or in a real world setting, you know, there's too many variables going on that might influence that. But I guess if you look at those studies, this probably what you see out of them is that the fluid replacement and the hydration status will influence performance, but the sodium doesn't. It's about the total amount of water that's sitting around in the blood or the total body water. And really the sodium is just there to balance whatever that fluid replacement needs to be to optimize performance, assuming that it needs to be there. Can you go over with, for the audience some of like the physiological underpinnings or some of the theories as to why that actually is, why that why that total body water matters so much when other components don't seem to? Yeah, so it's a tricky one from a mechanistic point of view. I don't think we still really fully grasp like what it is about hydration or dehydration, if you like, that impacts negatively on performance. Uh, what we tend to see in those studies so, you know, those classic hydration studies where they give everyone like 100% fluid replacement or they don't let them drink anything, which is kind of the classic dichotomy that you see in most of those studies. And of course, they're not blinded because how do you blind whether you drank fluid or not? Mm -hmm. Apart from, I think there's three nasogastric tube studies where they actually gave yeah, the yeah. fluid through a, a tube to, to blind it. Or they IV um, it. I've seen that in a couple of studies. Yeah, yeah, they exactly. And they IV. do that beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so in those situations, what you tend to see in the people who didn't have any fluid is their perception of effort was higher. So it feels harder to work at the same pace um, or they they work to the same perception of effort if it's like a time trial, but they're going slower for that same 
perception of effort you know it's kind of the flip side to that yeah. um generally if it's again if it's a, a fixed intensity of exercise their heart rate will be higher so that sort of cardiac drift classic that you see with dehydration um and their body temperature tends to be a little bit higher as well although it's actually not that much but it is a bit higher now which of those things i mean that gets into the whole like what causes fatigue is it central is it like that's an old other an old can of worms that would take another four podcasts probably to unpack so we, we won't go there um but yeah one of the interesting things that one of the things i'm interested in is you know is it the total body water that's important that influences all those things or is it the actual plasma volume like the volume of fluid within the blood vessels and does it not matter about the rest of the body and again i don't think we've fully unpacked that i think from a body temperature point of view it seems to be probably the total body water that's more important uh, and there has been some suggestions as well that in fact you know the higher heart rate and things isn't actually to do with a lower blood volume which sort of physiologically makes sense but actually maybe something about that dehydration impacts on the the endocrine system so your hormones your stress hormones your cortisols your adrenalines and all those sorts of things and that then goes on and has other impacts throughout the body but you know human biology biology is so complex that yeah. i think we're a long way from fully unpacking all of that which is crazy it's water right at the end yeah. of the day and we're still a long way from unpacking it as you just mentioned yep. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to move to something that's a, a lot more practical and kind of like down to earth for the everyday athletes that are going to go out there and train. Maybe they're running right now with their headphones or whether they're, they're going to go train a, a, a session tomorrow, because we've been talking a lot about about an ultra marathon race situation, which we're going to I'm going to revisit at the end. Um, I, I want to specifically point to this is Alan slide number uh, 16 in the ones that you sent me that is it necessary, physically possible and practically achievable. Uh, if you want to cue this up and 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 share your screen, the the YouTube uh, viewers can actually uh, see see this if you're tuning into that version. But we're going to walk through this flow chart, so to speak, that Alan's prepared, and, and I think this is a really practical representation representation of what you can do from a training perspective to start to plan out your fluid and sodium leads or lack or lack thereof. Because it literally walks you through if this scenario, not this, if that scenario, not that. And then the title of this of, of this slide in particular, which I think is I, I think really gets to the heart of the the heart of the matter of how we try to solve all problems in sort in sports science. Is it necessary? Is it a problem that we actually need to solve? Which you have to cross that line first, right? Because sometimes we're we're trying to solve for things that really aren't that material. Second thing, is it practically possible, meaning is the solution that you want to put in place even feasible? Some, and sometimes it's not. And the second and the third piece of it, is it actually achievable? Me, meaning, do you have kind of the resources and the faculty and the 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 kind of the wherewithal to actually put implement the 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 plan into place? So, Alan, I want you to walk through that. Um, do you want me to share my screen on my side? Because I don't, I don't see it popping. Um, yeah, it's disabled at my end. You have to okay. enable that, I think. Oh, okay. Never mind. I will do that really quick. Hold on. Uh, da, da, da. So now you should have it. Yep. Perfect. Cool. Sweet. There we go. Yep. Beautiful. All right. So, yeah. So, as you said, it's, it's that kind of three-step process about, you know, is it necessary is it physically possible and is it practically achievable so we start off i guess with the um and i'll get to that flow chart in a sec but i thought this might be handy that first question and the 70 percent here we'll probably get to that a little bit later that seems to be the tipping point where actually replacing sodium starts to become necessary is when you're replacing more than about 70 percent of your fluid losses so you're drinking relative to sweat rate um, so is that likely to be beneficial for you and this is what we were sort of talking about before that you know obviously the the greater the total sweat loss the closer to 100 percent you have to go to replace that fluid to whether it's a one percent two percent three percent whatever kind of body mass loss percentage that you're kind of aiming for in that scenario so the red line there is the 70 percent so essentially when you go uh, north of that line is is when that um, seventy percent is crossed, and when sodium replacement might be beneficial. So you can see, obviously, the longer the event, the more likely that is. Um, and this is just an example of like different body weights of athletes. So if you're fifty kilos versus ninety, how that moves that line. So it moves it a little bit, but not you know the overall pattern stays pretty much the same. So this yeah, you know, so it's just that. 
So the second question, is it physically possible? And what I mean here is from a gut tolerance point of view and being able to drink it without choking on it. And the example I've used here is elite marathon running because in an elite marathon, obviously if you're going at Kipchoge pace, you know, 21 Ks an hour or whatever it is, firstly, you know, you need to be able to drink that volume of fluid without choking on it when you're breathing that heavily. I mean, he's what putting out a VO2 of probably 60 mils per kilo per minute um, just to maintain that kind of pace, maybe even more higher, closer to 70 or something like that, you know, sort of 85, 90% of his VO2 max, which is higher than the rest of us anyway. So just being able to, you know, breathe and drink that volume at that pace. And I was, I was talking to um, an Australian Olympic marathoner the other day, and it was something that she really struggled with early on in her career as well. So you've got to be able to do that, but you've also then got to have the gut tolerance to be able to consume that volume of fluid and keep it down as well. And so that becomes the second factor that might physically stop you from being able to actually consume that much fluid to meet whatever percentage body mass loss you're trying to achieve. And then the third one, oh, sorry, I've just an example here, you know, if your sweat rate is greater than about 1.8 litres an hour, you're probably going to have, well, to hit that 70%, you're going to have to drink more than 1.3 litres an hour. And as you said before, that's very difficult for the vast majority of people um, either to physically access that amount of fluid or just to keep it down physically, uh, particularly when you're running at that sort of pace that someone like Kipchoge would be running at. Like there's no way he would be able to drink 1.3 litres an hour of fluid, I suspect. Yeah, just the, from a practical perspective, like the soft flasks in most people's bottles, those are half a liter. Mm. So you normally care, carry two up front, right? One on each mm. you know, side of your chest. That's yep. more than that every single hour. Every single person out here listening to this will say, no, I definitely don't drink that much. Yes. One liter per hour on any mm. on any normal training run, it, it, you know, with the exception of people out in Arizona and California yep. that are like baking during the summer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, in an ultra, generally you, your sweat rate would be lower than that because the intensity is a lot lower than that. And we'll, we'll come to that with the flow chart as well to help people kind of make that decision. Then the third part, which kind of gets to what you're just talking about there, is it actually practically achievable? And the example, I mean, this wasn't a, a sports specific um, session that I was giving was soccer because you know you have 90 minute halves and during that it's continuous play there is no access to fluid yeah. and so it's before the game at half time and after the game that's pretty much the only chances you get with rare exceptions in hot environments sometimes they modify the rules for drinks and things but generally speaking unless you're the goalkeeper that's all that the chances that you get to drink and so you know you might think that replacing 80 percent of your fluid losses is important you might be able to tolerate it but if the fluid physically isn't there and you can't access it within the rules of your competition, then what's the point? What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So you really have to satisfy all three of those scenarios before you're going to cross that 70% and then and you know, we'll get into it and maybe look at the graph shortly. That's when you know replacing sodium seems to be necessary for the for the average person. So that gets to, I think this is the one that you were talking about, is this kind of um, little flow chart here. So I guess th the way I tend to think about it is start off with exercise duration. And as a general rule, if your exercise is less than four hours, you're very unlikely to sort of cross that sort of four or five liter cumulative sweat loss mark that actually aggressively replacing fluid would be important. Or you're going to be in a situation like the Kipchoge where you're not going to be able to physically drink at the rate required to do that anyway because the intensity is so much higher, the duration is so much shorter. And so in that case, for the majority of people, if it's less than four hours, you know, I just say season to taste. In other words, choose your sodium based on taste preferences rather than trying to hit a specific amount because you're just not drink, going to drink enough fluid realistically to need to replace a certain amount of sodium. But if it's over four hours, then I tend to look at the hourly sweat rate. And again, you know, using 1800 mils an hour is probably a good rule of thumb, because again, if your sweat rate is greater than that, you're going to be needing to drink sort of 1.3 liters an hour plus of fluid to actually need sodium to stop your sodium, blood sodium from falling. And so if that's the case, it's going to be very unrealistic in most scenarios that people could actually do that. So again, seasoning to taste. And I think this is the one that probably challenges people a lot because yeah. the traditional thinking is high sweat rate. Therefore I'm losing a lot of sodium. Therefore I have to replace it much more aggressively. But the point is if you can't replace your fluid aggressively and that's aggressive relative to the sweat rate, not aggressive in general, 
then you don't need to replace the sodium aggressively either. But if your sweat rate is less than that, this is kind of just a general guideline. So if it's over four hours, your sweat rate is less than 1800 mils an hour, which both of those scenarios are pretty much universal for ultra running. And then looking at, well, are you likely for other reasons to replace you know, more or less than 70% of your fluid losses? And if the answer is no, because of gut issues, because of fluid availability, whatever it is, then again, there's probably not going to be a need to go out and do a sweat test and work out specifically what your sodium loss is and replace it. But if it is, and in most scenarios, that would probably be beneficial, then that's when you might proceed to sweat sodium testing. So that's really the only scenario where you would go and do that. And then depending on the result of that test, you know, if it's less than sort of 40 millimoles per litre, which is about the average, if you look at um, you know, Gatorade have done a lot of studies with thousands of people where they've published all the data and the average sits around 35, 40 millimoles per litre. So if you're sort of average or below, again, you probably don't need, you probably need some sodium, but not very much. You can probably just, you know, your normal foods and fluids are going to give you some sodium anyway, and that'll probably be adequate. It's not until you get into those sort of higher sweat sodium concentrations that replacing more than that might actually be of use to stop your blood sodium falling. And the, the only caveat on that I've got in the, the far left there is if you're replacing more than 90% of your fluid losses, which is not that common, but it can happen in the really long stuff, then you, know, you might have to go a little bit higher than these values. A lot of, a lot of runners will identify this as kind of a training situation. And mm. before we, before we get to that, for the people that are listening to the podcast and trying to envision this, this flow chart that, uh, uh, that, that Alan has presented, can I have access to this? Can I link this into the show notes as yeah, well? Yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot there. Thank you. I encourage you guys to go and look at this because I, I think it very eloquently just des describes the situation, but the, the way that I follow this cascade of events is kind of down the left hand column of this, which mm. the only re the only time you're going to have to really pay attention to replacing your sodium, I'm starting at the bottom, right? The bottom mm -hmm. left hand corner essentially, is if your exercise duration is over four hours, and if your hourly sweat rate is is great. Why am I getting confused on the greater than, less than, on the 1,800 milliliters, 1,800 milliliters an hour? Yeah, so it's less than. Yeah, if, it, if it's less than 1,800 milliliters an hour, and if you are going to replace greater than 70% of it, and if your sweat sodium testing indicates that you are a salty sweater, we're not going to get into the middle moles. That's kind yeah. of the only practical situation where you really have to, from a training, almost from a training perspective, not from a, like a long ultra marathon perspective, where you really have to pay attention to supplementing with sodium or replacing a large part of the sodium losses. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, you know, the, the right-hand side there where it says season to taste, it's not saying you should avoid sodium yes. completely. It's just saying that you don't need to have a specific amount to, you know, stop changes in your blood sodium concentration because in all of those scenarios, it's going up anyway. So taking more sodium will only exacerbate what's already happening so in those scenarios it's about having sodium based on your personal taste preferences and what feels good to you rather than and you don't need a sweat test to tell you that okay if this goes back to one of the themes that i just keep seeing in product development and support science is in a lot of ways we are getting overly specific for the practical recommendations that athletes need to take in i'm not just picking on nutrition i'm picking mm. on kind of like everybody most most of the time and most reasonable and I, I mean this is an extreme situation right greater than four mm. hours you're working out hard and things like that but even when we take it to that you only need to be really specific in a in certain situations yep exactly right yep oh man everybody's gonna be throwing away their salt tablets after this alan and what are we going to do about that <laughs> Well, if, if you, well, not so much the tablets, but I guess if you're putting, you know, dissolvable tablets in your yeah, drinks yeah. and you like the taste of it, there's no reason to necessarily yeah. get rid of it if you like it, but there's, I guess, no reason to have a specific amount. Because but many people, I guess what I'm getting at is, is there's nothing wrong with that, but many people view it as necessary, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm emphasizing yeah. that word intentional, like I have to do this, otherwise my performance is going to deteriorate or something like really deleterious is going to happen. Yeah. And as I said before, like people that swear black and blue that that's exactly what happened to them and they just had sodium and it solved all their problems. I suspect what's happened is it's actually 
you know, yes, they've had more sodium, but they've also had a lot more fluid because mm. if they just took all the extra sodium and had the same amount of fluid replacement as before, either before they were becoming hyponatremic and the sodium was necessary, or they just weren't drinking enough and now they are. And that's the big part of the big reason that they're feeling better. Yeah, but in addition to that, there's a huge placebo effect. And you and I both recognize this, that yeah. we've been in like, there's a large part of the population that's kind of been ingrained with this, with this fact that if you are feeling bad, and or you're having cramps, sodium is your pathway out of that. Mm -hmm. And you take that and then there's a psychological boost, there's a there's a rush of endorphins, and you think that you're going to magically be cured. And a lot of times that prof that that prophecy actually fulfills. But here, what you're saying physiologically is there's not a lot of basis for that act for that phenomenon actually happening. Yeah, yep. And I think what's interesting here is if you know going back to what you said at the start, and you know the guidelines around uh, sodium replacement, and I guess the the two that sort of dichotomous schools of thought of you know you need to be aggressive with your sodium replacement or no, you're not. This kind of sits in the middle of that because it's saying yeah. well you do need to be aggressive but only in certain situations mm -hmm. in others you don't need to worry about it so i think if we compare it to those two camps you know the people that are you know testing sweat sodium on a one hour training run and you know getting really <laughs> particular about replacing that or in team sports that are only go for 90 minutes or something like that and and this suggests that that's completely unnecessary but on the other hand in the ultra scene a lot of it is like just do whatever you don't need any sodium and it's like well yes you can get away with that and not get hyponatremia but you have to progressively dial down the amount of fluid you replace as a percentage of your losses and eventually that'll get to the point where it's going to impact on performance or potentially health if it's too extreme well and so i started out with the podcast i started out the podcast kind of presenting that this situation is extremely dynamic and it's difficult to pin down because of that dynamic nature and i'm going to kind of come back to that one of the one of the reasons that it's hard to pin down is because what you do what you can do in training and you just you just presented this in this flow chart might be drastically different than what you do on race day depending upon the duration of that race and this is one of those yep. infinitely difficult complexities within ultramarathon not only around sodium but around a lot of areas because the diff, because the time duration of a singular training activity is so much smaller than the time duration of the actual event that in a lot of situations you are doing things different in the race as opposed to training, which is like the quintessential no-no that we've all yeah. been taught that we've all been taught to do. Yeah. Yet that's the kind of the like not not that you can't do it in training. It's just not necessary, nor is it yeah. is it ergogenic. So that just adds to the complexity, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, totally. Okay, let's move on to the, I want to add a little bit of clarification around the 70% number, mm -hmm. because okay. a lot of people are going to fixate on that, whether they're, whether they're going to read the paper or they're listening to that, and they're going to think, ah, oh, I only need to replace 70% of the fluid losses. Yep. Give some context around that before we have people come and yell and scream at us afterwards, Alan, because they'll definitely do that if we just yep. leave it at that. Yeah. So I guess the 70% comes from not so much how much fluid you need to replace during exercise, but at what point in your fluid replacement does sodium come into the picture? So I'll just, I'll tee up the slide for that, which I'll start off with some, some real life data from real life participants and then look at, you know, what the modeling shows, which kind of mirrors that. So I guess this comes back to managing blood sodium concentration. And so in the ultra sense, you know, really hyponatremia prevention in a way. And so this particular study was from the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. So, you know, people might have preconceived ideas about what that means or not. But uh, this was actually the original study that validated the equation that I then used in my modeling. And in this particular study, it's only a two hour run uh, in 30 degrees, 70% of VO2 max intervals with a couple of minute rest throughout. And then a, there was a performance test at the end, but I'm pretty sure this data is just from that, the two hours before the performance test. And what's interesting in this study is that they've given them sodium replacement. They've actually done it in milligrams per liter of fluid consumed. 
or in this case per 100 mils. So you've got zero sodium, the white bars, the gray bars are 37 milligrams per 100 mils. It says 18 because it's 18 millimoles. Uh, and then 69 milligrams per 100 mils of fluid consumed. So per 100 mils is probably how people might think about it in terms of looking on food labels of their sports yeah. drinks or something and seeing how much is in there. Yeah. But what you can see here is that you've got three different levels of sodium replacement, but then you've also got four different levels of fluid replacement. So you've got scenarios where they gave people enough fluid on the far left to only lose four or to lose 4% of their body mass. So they're becoming relatively dehydrated to lose 2% of their body mass. So sort of getting around those sort of guidelines, 0% so they didn't lose any body mass or actually overhydrated. So they've gained 2% of their body mass through fluid intake. And then you've given them those three different levels of sodium. So I think what becomes clear here is that firstly, that the fluid intake has far more impact on the, the sodium concentration, which is the vertical axis on this graph. So the S is serum, so serum sodium concentration and the delta means the change in so did it go up the bars go up if did it go down the bars go down and by how much and so you can see there that the sodium had much less impact than the fluid replacement did on whether the blood sodium went up or down now this would be used as an argument so that's kind of the water effect between yeah, the, the highest fluid and say. the lowest fluid intake and then that's the sodium effect between the highest and lowest sodium replacement. Now, this was actually used then by Tim Noakes in his book, Waterlogged, in a publication to argue that sodium was irrelevant and it's all about the fluid. And, you know, to some degree, that is probably true. What I would say here is that the differences between the lowest and the highest fluid intake here are very extreme. You know, 4% body mass loss versus 2% body mass gain. That's a big difference. Very aggressive versus very not aggressive. Mm -hmm. The differences in sodium intake here are definitely not from the low, well, zero is obviously the lowest possible, but this is nowhere near the highest possible sodium intake that someone could take during exercise. I mean, 690 milligrams per litre. Uh, that's a regular go, commercial sports drink, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's so you a could run do, of the mill, middle of the road commercial sports yeah, drink. Yeah. So you could go double, triple that yep. quite easily and, yep. and tolerate that just fine. So I think in some ways, it's probably a little bit of an unfair comparison because you're comparing the extremes of water intake between a much smaller range of sodium intake. And if you had, you know, instead of 30 millimoles per liter, which is that black bar, you had, you know, 60 millimoles per liter or 80 millimoles per liter, that sodium effect would be a lot larger as well. Probably still not as large as the water effect, but a lot larger here. And so... I don't know if I'd say that this has been cherry picked, but I think it's certainly been <laughs> potentially misinterpreted a little bit or, or uh, just overemphasized. I'll say cherry picked because it's Tim and I don't mind. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely, I definitely don't, I definitely don't mind uh, mm. say, saying that about him. He, he and I mm. don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Um, mm. that, that's another story. But I think once again, a good, like outside of the sodium stuff, a, this is actually a really good example of how you can spin a study to fit your narrative depending mm. upon the angle that you are looking at it and how you are not interpreting the data, but how you're presenting the effects of the, uh, of the, the effects of the change that you're seeing in the actual research. Mm. Yep. And certainly Tim's not the only one to have, have sort of made that kind of a statement. So, you know, I wouldn't say it's specific to him necessarily, but I think what was interesting for me and, and this kind of bears out in the model is if we're aiming to maintain a stable blood sodium concentration, at what point does it stop going up on the left there and start going down on the right? Because when it goes down, that having sodium is going to help lower that fall, if you like. And so somewhere, so I guess what we're saying here is that there's some important role for sodium, but water seems to be more important. But again, that might be a little bit um, because of the design of the study. Yeah. But somewhere between here and here is where the crossover point comes, where the bars stop going up and start going down. And that's when sodium replacement would start to theoretically lower the extent to which it falls, which is obviously your black bar compared to the white bar in the blue circle there. So that's where the modeling gets to that 70% mark, which was the question that you asked. So um, oh, that's, that's just the equation. I'll just skip through that quickly. This is the results of that equation. So this is very similar to what we just saw, but this is theoretical data rather than actual data. And here we've got different levels of fluid replacement, but now it's in the percentages of fluid loss. So this scenario is 1,500 mils an hour of sweat rate. 
and then you're replacing 50, 60, 70, 80, or 90% of that. And you can see the, the fluid intake volumes underneath. And then you've got four different sweat sodium concentrations, which pretty much span from the, the least saltiest sweater to the most saltiest sweater. And then you've got, again, on the vertical axis, the change in blood sodium concentration is going up, down, and by how much. And what you see is that the crossover point seems to happen for the majority of people with normal kind of sweat sodium concentrations around that 40 millimoles per litre, or maybe slightly above that, is happening at around that sort of 70 to, you know, just above 70% fluid replacement mark. So that's where that 70% comes from. But you can see if you are an unusually salty sweater, 80 millimoles, I've actually never seen that in my career. I think the highest I've seen is about 72, 73. Um, you know, that crossover point comes at about 50 to 60 percent replacement and if you're a very low salt sweater it doesn't really come in until about 85 90 percent replacement so it does vary a little bit but i guess that 70 percent rule i'll put there is it would cover the vast majority of people with yeah. normal unquote unquote sweat sodiums so don't take 70 percent as a do this don't do that you're using it as a reference point to where yep. sodium supplementation is going to start to play in effect or where you actually have to start to think about it yeah yeah, exactly. And if you've got extremely salty sweat, maybe lower that value a little bit. If you've got very unsalty sweat, maybe you can, um, you know, not not worry about it so much until you're sort of eighty percent plus. Okay, we're so we're gonna leave that. We're gonna leave the athletes with this since you just talked about salty sweat. How can an athlete get a fix on that? Because that's the end of the that's like the end of your waterfall. The very final linchpin is, is do you have salty sweat or not to where it actually mm. really becomes impactful on where you need to actually start to pay attention to this. And in some scenarios, those are all my caveats. Yeah, exactly. How, how, right. can, you, how so, can you get how can you get a fix on it? Let's kind of run through the range of scenarios mm, that mm. people can that people can practically go through. Yeah. So obviously to, to work out how much salt is in your sweat, you're going to have to have a sample of that sweat. And there's been different ways historically over the years to collect that. The gold standard is considered what's called a whole body washdown, which basically boils down <laughs> to exercising in a plastic giant plastic bag. Uh, it generally has to be done on a bike because you can't use a motorized uh, treadmill in there because as I'll describe in a minute, you would destroy your treadmill. Um, you want to do it in as little clothing as possible. So when they do these studies, they just wear like almost like running shorts or you know, not usually cycling nicks because that can absorb too much in the chamois. Um, and then just topless, no shoes, no socks, no nothing. And then you, you do your exercise. You're obviously sweating. Some of that stays on the skin surface. Some of that drips off onto the frame of the bike or onto the floor with the bottom of this plastic bag. And then at the end of it, they get either deionized water or some other chemical solution and they basically shower you in it. So, you know, liters of the stuff pours all over you to wash all the sweat off your body. They do the same to the bike to wash all the sweat that's stuck on the bike and the, the minerals off into the bottom of the bag. And then you get out, you take all your clothes off and leave them in the bag and you get out, start naked, and then you go and get washed up and changed. And then you end up with this giant plastic bag, which has the washed bike and all your dirty <laughs> clothes in it uh, and, and this lovely soup of sweat and chemicals, basically. And then they take the bag and they kind of swirl it around to mix it all the the liquid together at the base of the bag and then they take a sample of that and because they know how much they've used in the shower they can work out um, basically how much sodium is in the the sweat that you lost during that period of time obviously very impractical very unrealistic <laughs> you're going to destroy your you know your motorized treadmill if you try to do that for a runner so because of that it's very rarely done except yeah. in certain research labs that are well set up kind of yeah. to do that and the other problem is you can't simulate, you know, airflow in terms of fans and things. You can't simulate, you know, get incredibly humid in that kind of environment. So, yeah, very unrealistic, but it's good to actually understand the physiological mechanisms in the lab. So what happens instead is we try and take samples from the skin surface, and that's where that sort of patch testing comes in. And that's what's been historically used is like a cotton patch with a, a waterproof dressing over it, basically like wound dressings they use in hospitals is typically what's used. Uh, you put them onto the skin surface for a period of time. The cotton bit absorbs some of that sweat as you're sweating. And then you can take that off. And there's a couple of different ways to extract the sweat from that. And then you can measure the sodium concentration. Now, these days there's... You know, the wearables, you showed one before um, where we're trying to do this in a way that we can reuse that mechanism. And also we don't need 
skilled technicians to clean down the site, apply the patch, take it off, you centrifuge the patch to extract the sweat and all of, and, and you know, then measure it on lab equipment. So we're yeah. you know, trying to remove all of those steps to be able to do it at home with a, a wearable. I guess the one thing with both the patches and the wearable devices is, and I've mentioned this a couple of times already, is that the sodium concentration in your sweat varies at different parts of your body. Uh, and it's probably to do with the density of sweat glands and all you know, clothing that you wear and, and all sorts of different things. And so you take the sweat sodium concentration you get at, at on a forearm, which is probably the most commonly used patch, um, patch site, generally speaking that the number you get there will be higher than what it would be across the whole body if you did that whole body wash down that i mentioned before and so there has been some research to come up with equations now that you can predict or, or estimate the whole body value based on the value at certain sort of standardized patch sites where they've actually done both simultaneously in the lab so what the people are now wondering is is i don't have access to any of this stuff right now mm. I don't know where to get a patch. There's a few commercially available and you can go yep. on the internet. We're not going to endorse one or the other. Mm. Is it good enough to say, Hey, I've got a lot of salt on my shirt or on my hat, because at the end of the day, you're getting, you're giving people, you know, in your, in your uh, scenario, you're giving people like a high, medium, low category. Yeah. Can well, people uh, realistically go and do that. Yeah, it's a good point because sweat sodium does vary probably 15% from day to day, even if you're doing exactly the same thing. Um, it changes whether your diet changes, which is something I looked at in my PhD. So if you load up on salt the two or three days before a race, for example, thinking I need to load up on salt, in fact, the kidneys will flush 95% of that out anyway, um, but, but it will actually make your, salt, uh, your sweat more salty on race day. Not by a huge amount. I found three days doesn't have a massive difference. If you did it for a week, maybe more substantial. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of actually then you know, using salt on your skin, I guess the thing I would say with that is that, you know, triathletes, for example, if you got out of the ocean, did that salt come from your sweat or from the ocean for a start? Um, one of the big issues. The other issue there is, you know, I go, oh, I've got really salt, you know, big salt crust on my clothes today. I didn't last week. Well, was that because you wore a white t-shirt last week and a black t-shirt this week? <laughs> um, they're the sort of things that you it's need background. to bear in mind. Yeah, exactly. And And again, you know, the total amount of salt there, is about the total sweat loss. So yeah. it's going to be duration dependent as well. The longer you go, the more sweat you've lost onto the clothes or the skin or whatever. And then as the water bit evaporates, the salt is left behind. And so sometimes it might be more of a function of duration than it is a function of sweat sodium concentration. Yeah. So it's a difficult one. I mean, if you're doing the same two hour ride or run or whatever it is, and you've changed your diet or something and you notice this, salt the the salt crust is worse and one and then the other but everything else is pretty much the same yeah maybe it is an indication of sweat sodium concentration but i don't think it's enough to just go i've got a salty crust i yeah. must be a salty sweater that's what i kind of keep coming back to too i know because everybody thinks that they have like salty sweat you kind of ask them mm -hmm. and it's definitely not proportional to any of the bell curves that the gssi have put out or anything yeah. i keep having hope that the very and i i'm i'm the most skeptical person of the wearable industry so everybody who's listening to this you can take this into the context of this next statement. I keep hoping that the wearables will come back with a reliable way to do it. Mm. And the, re the reason that I'm hopeful for that is because in the scope of everything that the wearables are trying to measure, this is like the simplest molecule that you can measure. Mm. Sodium, it's yep. electrolyte. It's not that complex. It's small. Yep. It's, mm. We know the charge of it. Mm. <laughs> it's not like measuring something in the blood right? Which, which yep. you're trying to do, you're trying to measure on the skin. So I guess what I'm saying is, is with all due respect to the people that are trying to solve this problem, they'll probably yell at me, do the complexities of all this now. And you, you, you're more familiar with this than I am. What I'm saying is on balance in terms of the things that you are trying to solve, this is one of the more impactful ones. And then actually being able to solve it in real time with a wearable is actually one of the more simple things that you can actually start to look at. And then you compare it with the ridiculous situation that you just mentioned of how very few labs, but some labs actually do it with this whole deionized de water bath afterwards. It's just totally preposterous. Like mm. anybody who has ever seen that done, you just look at it and like, this is the most ridiculous setup ever. <laughs> mm, mm. And I have seen it. I've seen some photos. I didn't see it live. And I don't know if you have, I think they might've done it at Kona one year. They actually had people oh like, 
like Ridiculous. these like kiddie pools with like the plastic bag in the bottom of it and then like a bike set up on a trainer in the kiddie pool and then yeah there's pictures of people like having water doused over their head at the end of the session oh my god totally ridiculous mm. all right alan thanks for coming on the podcast this is um enlightening uh to say the least i have a little bit of a different perspective on how we're going to apply some of this with athletes it's going to be something that i literally start using and implementing tomorrow I mean, that's, I, there are very few conversations where and very few pieces of research where I can, where I can say that, where I can look at it and go, I'm going to look at this differently tomorrow than I did yesterday. Cause normally it just takes so much to like turn that Titanic of practice around. This is something where it's practical. It makes a lot of sense. It's something that we've all been theorizing for a lot of years. And finally you, you know, crunch the numbers behind it. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, as I mentioned to you offline, there's going to be an accompanying piece to this podcast where we're going to discuss this amongst our coaching group. And at the time I'm recording this right now, I don't know if it's going to be at the very end of this podcast or it's going to be in a separate podcast. So y'all are just going to have to wait until the outro to actually, to actually listen to this. But I think that the reason that I mentioned that right now is it's, it's emblematic of how impactful I think this is, is I think it's worth doing a two part with our, with our coaching staff to discuss. So thank you. Is there anything else that you want to, is there anything else you want to leave the listeners with? How can they get a hold of you? Where can they learn more about this? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess the first thing before I get into that would be just to say, obviously this is theoretical data based on a mathematical model. So it may turn out that it's not quite perfect in the real world, but I think what it does allow us to do is conceptualize the basics of how this is going to play out. And, and as you said, like, you know, you're trying to hit a moving target throughout an event yeah. where you don't have even feedback on whether you're hitting that target yep. or not, yep. and the target's moving simultaneously. So it's never going to be precise anyway. So well, we've talked about kind of precise numbers today. They never will be in the real world. And if the model turns out to be 5% out or 10% out, it probably doesn't matter anyway. It just gives you that conceptual framework, I think, to to how to kind of look at all of this and, and how to put it together. Uh, in terms of contacting me, um, I work from Monash University. That's sort of where I do teaching and, and research. So if you just Google my name and Monash University, you'll find the you know, researcher pages and you know, as universities like to do, they'll put your email address up there, whether you like it or not. So you can contact me that way. <laughs> if you ever want to find a researcher, just Google them and the name of the university they work at and guaranteed you'll find their email address. because the There are no like pain points associated with that is what you're trying no. to say. None at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I guess on social media, so my Twitter handle is next. So this is from my private practice, Next Level Nutrition. So it's N-E-X-T-L-V-L-N-U-T. Um, or the the podcast that you mentioned before. So we have a Twitter handle for that, but also um, pretty active on Instagram now as well is The Long Munch. And so that's the, the both the Twitter and the Instagram handle. And we've got the longmunch.com is we've, we've got the website. It's, it's not built yet, but it's coming next year. And that's going to have a whole bunch of sort of written resources and things that accompany the podcast that we're, that we've been doing for a couple of years now. Links to all that will be in the show notes. Once again, thanks for coming on the podcast, Alan. No worries. Pleasure. I wanted to treat this more like a continuing ed. So maybe we can just like start there, right? And go through the points of confusion and then start to work back into the reality. I, I did not have an outline for this, but since Ryan just brought up it. So what other, after you guys read Alan's paper, looked at, it, looked at his slides and listened to the interview that I did with him, what other points of confusion exists in, exist in terms of I want to know more about this in order to apply it to my athletes. I think one thing is when all of this content comes about, I try to think of it of like, how are my athletes going to come to me and ask questions? And so listen to the recording um, yesterday that will be released later. And then I go back to podcast with Dr. Hydration podcast with Andy blow that like, it's saying this, and and when we listen to these things or read that article, we want to latch on to one thing, and then that sticks with us, and we forget everything else. And so I think when you're listening to this and, and anything, like you want to zoom out 
and and taking everything because there's one point in that recording coop that it's like okay let's stop right there this is what people are going to latch on to but let's clarify that um so i think yeah there's a lot of information out there for better and worse um and also for better and worse you have to do a lot of parsing through it um to get through it so this is yet another set of information that has similar themes to doctor hydration um andy blow and just like keep consuming more um pun with sodium and water <laughs> dr hydration being stavros yeah. Cavaros, which yes, i'll, 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 I'll link it's okay no it's all good it's it's all he has a he has a he yeah. has a very difficult name to pronounce and i probably just butchered it which he'll, he'll forgive me for i'll link that up in the show notes as well so anybody else with points of confusion before we kind of start to plow forward i, I don't necessarily yeah go ahead nicole sorry. oh i was gonna say i think you know as you take it all in and try to conceptualize it i come back to i wonder you know like yeah we want to match you know, know your fluid loss, know how much you're replacing, but like, is there any harm in just moving forward with the recommendation? You know, like, do we have evidence that consuming 450 milligrams per liter ingested, you know what I mean? Like maybe, maybe we don't need that much. It seems, it seems like from the math, you don't need that much, but like, is there harm or evidence in following that recommendation to continue to get as close as we can and guess if, Athletes don't know their sweat rate and don't know how salty of a sweater they are. Right. So I, I try to get through this with some of the conversation with Andy is, is we're trying to parse out the difference between deleterious and critical, right? And a lot of times when we talk about hyponatremia research, we're talking about not falling below a certain level to reach some sort of critical state, which would you know, instigate some sort of hospital event where we've got to immediately replace those, those that sodium loss somehow with some drastic, uh, some drastic type of intervention. Um, and, and that's a hard in this area. That is a hard line to 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 actually determine. And as we wrapped up with, I I don't think we know. I do want to Nicole. You bring up one really important point that I want you guys and all of our coaches and the people that are listening to this to kind of understand that. And he mentioned this during the podcast is this is a model, right? This is a model based on math. We're not putting humans on a treadmill or doing some sort of intervention study or actually like testing this with like a real person. This is a mathematical model. And a lot of times you have to start out that way in order to conceptually understand what type, what types of interventions are you going to use? How much fluid do you want to prescribe somebody to take in? I, I brought up during the podcast, the example of, uh, of the Nix pod, right? So they are going to offer up an athlete recommendations, right? Based on the inputs that they have, which is the duration of the intensity, the amount of fluid that they're losing and the, the electrolyte composition of the sweat that the unit is detecting. That might not be the right recommendation because of what, what we just learned. You're going to recommend something completely different based off of a five liter of, of sweat loss per scenario, which is four hour run, right? It's pretty realistic yeah. versus a 10 hour run scenario where you might lose 15 liters, right? Those two recommendations in terms of the rate and the amount to replenish could be completely different. And that's, that's what I want a lot of the listeners to, to kind of come away with is we, I think that we are well served to try to simplify recommendations as much as we can and try to weed through the nuance to come up with, this is exactly what you need to do. But this mm -hmm. is one of those areas where I think we, we are best served to add a little bit of complication to it and start to look at these kind of like graded scenarios of short run, medium run, long run race or so, like something like that, because the recommendations are going to be completely different across those scenarios. Yeah, I, I would just bring up, I, I don't know if this is a point of confusion, but just like the broader view is that, you know, like the podcast was saying that Alan was saying that, you know, up to four hours replenishment, not as necessary, Yeah. you know, if, if you can't replenish, 70 or don't replenish 70% or more your fluid less necessary knowing your sodium sweat concentration. Uh, if you don't know that not, not necessary. And that just highlighted to me that, you know, most athletes are training less than four hours. Most athletes when they train don't have as much access or any access to replenishment. And most athletes do not know their 
sodium concentration in her sweat. And so no wonder, you don't know no anything. Wonder when, well, exactly. And so no wonder when we go into a 50 mile race, a hundred mile race and the time scale becomes so much greater and the environmental conditions become so much greater. Uh, the duration obviously is, is more, that's when we start having issues. Yeah. And so the big, big takeaway is we need to have as athletes and as coaches coaching our athletes, we need to have more experience in those runs of four hours, six hours, eight hours and beyond. And we need to have more experience with replenishment during those training runs. Yeah. To, to, to illustrate the easy math. And I know a lot of people are not going to take the time to go and like view these slides that I'm going to put up in the show notes and a failure of audio is, is trying to just trying to describe these things in words, which don't really do it justice. But I think the simplest way to think about it is a, no, a normal dude. I'm going to hate to bias this towards men. I'm sorry, Nicole, but it's, it's the easiest way for my feeble brain to, to, to work it out. It's going to be about 70 kilograms. 2% of 70 kilograms is 1.4 kilograms, right? If you want to talk about a 2% body water loss, that's mm. almost, we'll just round it up to one and a half liters, right? If we're saying that one and a half liters is 2% and below 2% is where we want to start, that's what we want to start to avoid. That's a reasonable amount of fluid loss. It's not a lot. But you go out and run on something that's not an extremely hot day. It's winter here everywhere, and especially in Colorado, especially in Colorado I ran at five degrees this morning. It's going to take me a long time. It might take me three or four hours to lose 1.5 liters of fluid. And mm. so when, when you kind of like when, – when you kind of look at that, I think it just starts to paint the picture of now we want to layer on what the sodium that you would want to replace on top of that – and it becomes a scenario where most people are going to be like, oh, wow, I, it's like I don't need to worry about this until far longer than I originally thought. It's just a lot of fluid is kind of what I'm, what, what I'm getting at. So, Duncan, to your point, I want to talk. I really want to work through this initially because we are we're trying to give guidance to athletes on fluid and sodium replacement based off of three variables that are at best difficult to acquire and at worst we're just totally guessing so <laughs> and we don't have good mechanisms of getting it right because you have to know the start starting serum sodium concentration you have to know the electrolyte or the sodium composition of the sweat and you have to know how much fluid you're losing right those aren't easy things and you can split the middle you know, and just try to like, kind of like average it for people. But I'm wondering after you guys thought of this, what reasonable ways outside of going to a lab and getting a deionized water bath after you exercise on a, a after you exercise on a, 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 on an ergometer, isn't that just a completely asinine way of doing it? Right. <laughs> like what other way, what other ways can you like go about getting this like what like an athlete's like okay i know what to do but i don't know how to get the variables in order to tell me how much to take in i'll jump in does nobody want to yeah go ahead nicole <laughs> no you're right so you said three variables these are difficult right maybe we won't have the sodium concentration of the sweat maybe we won't have the electrolyte composition of the sweat sweat loss was the third variable you said so like we can test that pretty easily with athletes, right? And this is a normal practice that we'll do um, is you have an athlete go out and weigh themselves before they run, you know, nude weight, go to the bathroom beforehand, go run for an hour, try not to ingest anything while you're out there. And then you weigh yourself after, right? And you can get an idea of how much weight you lost and convert it to, right? Like one kilogram is a liter, right? Am I right? Yeah. Um, so like we can get this estimate of your sweat loss and ideally we would do this across a variety of environments, right? Cause your sweat rate's going to be greater on a hot day versus a cold day. So sometimes we'll send athletes out, right? For maybe three different temperatures. So they have an idea of their range of where, where, what their sweat rate is on across, across that spectrum. Um, but I think the thing that's interesting that we come to after reading through this is that 
you know, like we, we've always given this recommendation, like the, the longer duration that you're going to be out there, the closer to a hundred percent we're trying to get right. to, match, to yep. match your sweat rate. But that this paper kind of presents this, you know, like spectrum of percentages that you replace, right? So we may not know if you're a salty sweater, we may not know the concentration, but like if you know how much you're sweating and then you're starting to pay attention to how much you're consuming on an average four hour run and six hour run, like you can at least get to where you now have a percentage replaced, right? This is like a new concept for me. Like that's, and I think if you can get there, like, well, what do I, on an average, what am I replenishing? that can give you an idea of how much sodium will be required. So you're mentioning the sweat test, quick show of hands. How many of you have actually had, like had your athletes do this? Like the weight? Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's good. You guys now, everybody's showing hands for those of you listening, listening to the podcast version. Once again, failure of audio here. It's not as easy as it's described to create that entire portfolio that Nicole just mentioned, right? Because you have first, the biggest thing is the environment. So you're kind of Mm -hmm. talking about a whole year that you have to do this across. Like you could do like one every quarter to like balance out all of the different, all of the different temperature ranges. So it'll get it. You're absolutely right, Nicole. It'll get it close. Probably not precise because the error in those measurements is, you know, kind of who knows, you know, Duncan's been doing ultra marathons for long enough that you could probably remember the days of when the races used to use body weight. Uh, as yeah. part of like the medical check-in at aid stations. So you'd roll into an aid station and they'd weigh you and they'd use that as, you know, part of the kind of medical evaluation to determine if you were fit or fit or not fit or not to continue. And so my point with all that is, is it gets really problematic when you're, when you're, when you're doing in the field. But I think the thing is, is you can kind of just get it close. Right. And, and the, the, the reason that I like that tool, honestly, is to demonstrate to the athlete how different it usually is not 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 always is but it usually is across those temperature ranges because most people have this kind of like static view of i need to take in one bottle an hour right irrespective of the conditions maybe it's one and a quarter if it's really hot but really it could be like three or four fold difference from one temperature range to the other temperature of the range. And that's even excluding like that very edges of very edges of the bell curve. I get, so I guess my, what my point with that is, is the, I, I think that the highlight of that tool, yes, you can start to get the flu, like the exact fluid losses, but it's, I use it more as an education tool to, to, to demonstrate how, uh, how different it is at the different temperature ranges so that they can kind of apply those so they can apply the correct, like course, uh, correct magnitude of course correction as they go through a race with that same variance in temperature. And this is why ultra is a great, uh, Hmm. playground for this. You take any reasonably length ultra marathon, eight, 10, 12, 20 hours or whatever, you're going to go through a huge temperature range, especially for the ones that start in the wee hours in the morning, Leadville Trail 100, Duncan, you know that it starts at, yeah. you know, 4 a.m. and it's 20 degrees outside. And then all of a sudden, you know, 10 hours later, you're baking in the sun at 10,000 feet and it's 75 degrees. That's a big environmental range to try to, 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 try to nail uh, a hydration strategy down with because it is so dynamic. And you're not just describing Leadville, like you're describing yeah, yeah. almost any mountainous hundred, right? It's the same issue. Yeah. I'm just picking on Duncan because he's a Leadville winner and he doesn't <laughs> well, like to, he doesn't like say, to bring it up, but it's just my <laughs> way to pick on him. Well, I was going to say, I mean, that, that's the big one. Most athletes, if I, if I have an athlete doing a three hour, four hour type training run, they're doing it at five in the morning, six in the morning. They're done by eight or nine yeah. in the morning. <clears throat> that's the vast majority of their training. So a lot of athletes don't hit that noon, one, two, 4 PM time slot in terms of their training in particular after eight hours of running already or 12 hours of running already. And so the more we can train an athlete in that context, I think, you know, the the more information they're going to have. Yeah. This might be one of those areas where you actually do do something differently in racing as compared to training. And you kind of got to be okay with it. Like if you don't have a lot of experience, trying to replace fluids 
at a temperature range that you're not training in. First off, the error would be you got to train in that temperature range at some point just to kind of like teach it. But, you know, it's not practical for a lot of people who have real lives right. and they've got a narrow window of time to train and things like that. And so we've got to like, in in some cases, I do think you you have to break the old adage of you have to do something different in a race as compared to what you did in training. And that difference is we're going to take in more fluid at this rate and with this type of electrolyte composition within that, fl that fluid and, and kind of everything else intake. And you can come up with ways to model that, right? By extrapolating, mm -hmm. you know, what they're doing in normal training to a different temperature range or using, you know, Alan's model that, that, that he mentioned here. But at the end of the day, they're doing, and sometimes it's drastically different. Sometimes it's like double or triple. Instead of one bottle an hour, it's like two or three bottles an hour. And so like wrapping people's heads around that, I think is a, is a difficult challenge. And also you're going to have to slow down to do that. Because mm. so of the that, volume like, of fluid, right? Yeah. And like duration of intensity, the temperature's going up. Like, yeah, you don't get to that one, two o'clock time frame where it's kind of the hottest part of the day in training. Your, your four hour or less long runs, you can pace those very evenly. And then on race day, you're, you're going way longer for four hours. So from the get go, you got to dial it back a bit and then realize whenever I'm going to try this new thing on race day with fluid and sodium consumption, I'm going to do myself a favor and also back off a little bit to, to compensate for that. As nobody wants to hear that slow down. Right? But, yeah. <laughs> Some people are looking for an excuse. Maybe uh, ingesting the fluids is actually is actually an excuse. Go ahead, Fred. I can see you at the bit there. Yeah. So one thing that I was thinking when you were saying all of that, and also when listening to the other recording, is that I I was thinking about this idea of like doing things different in competition compared to compared to training, and I think that. It is true, although like if you are ever planning to do that in training, maybe even if it's just for like a one hour run, yeah. you should go like drinking a lot or like drinking a lot from the minute when you get out to like get used to that, like whatever it is, the slushing feeling of the water in the stomach and not come to competition. Like probably not a problem for someone who has a lot of experience in 100 miles because like they know, they know it already and what it feels like. It's like, oh yeah, I don't want this to be the next thing that that's that, like the new thing that is happening to me or to the athlete on race day. So it's like, I think it's this idea that like, it's something that you need to train for, but still what you were saying, like, it's something that you probably don't need to train for as much, or you just need to train it as practice for the race, yeah. but not as something that you need for training itself. Yeah. I mean, you're trying to, you have to figure out kind of what that tolerance is and you really don't know it until you test it. And even then when you test it, it's a little bit of a dice roll, you know, come around race day. Like, can you take in two, two liters of fluid in an hour? I mean, everybody out there, they, you know, that's four bottles. That's four soft lax worth of fluid. You might be able to do that for your one hour run. And it might not feel that good. And you'll kind of suck it up and just, you know, deal with your, you know, bloated belly at the end of it. But doing that in the middle of some sort of ultra marathon, that is a completely different proposition because of all of the other stressors that, uh, th that are going on. So you're absolutely right, Fred. I mean, you do have tools to do that, to kind of fake it, right? Fake and see what that tolerance is during, during training. But I do think you have to realize the limitations of those when you're practically implementing them with athletes. You, they, they probably are not going to convert one to one, but if you want to use it as a learning lesson to see how, Hey, this is how we could do it. Great. The other thing that, sorry, I've got a little bit of a cold today, so I'm sniffling. Um, the other thing that's extremely interesting with this is that I think it also brings up the the concept of where are your calories coming from? So if you're using a fluid ingestion rate that's higher than what you are using in training and you're using a commercial electrolyte replacement beverage that has some level of calories in it, you have to recognize that you might throw your total calorie balance out of whack because of these fluids that you're taking in that you didn't prepare for. And I see this all the time with athletes that are trying to use like, 
even like a six or eight percent carbohydrate solution, you know, and and that and that's not that much. I mean, that's not like one of the Roctane or or or, or, or Scratch Labs. Uh, what's the name of that product? I'm super, blanking. Yeah, the Super Fuel product, right? That's not even up to that level. I mean, that's going to be you know 120 calories in a in a soft flask, just to bring it back down to back down to practical terms. If you think about going through three of those in an hour, that's a liter and a half. That's 120 times three. That's 360 calories. Most athletes can't tolerate that. Should they be able to? That's a different question. But a lot of athletes just from a carbohydrate absorption perspective aren't going to be able to handle that. So now you've compounded this a couple of different ways because what most athletes will do will either dilute that drink, which dilutes the electrolyte concentration, or switch over to just plain water, which you know, fun, which functionally dilutes all of the electrolytes that you're taking in. And so back to the complexity piece, right? Think about th this is what I encourage athletes to do. When you have this big temperature range, think about the complexity piece of it, because it, it, it is going to be a more complicated math problem than take one sodium pill an hour. It's going to vary based on the temperature range of the race and then how long the race actually is. The good thing that's going for us before anybody jumps in too quick is that the training, the, in, the intensity of the training conditions that we're normally in are very close to the race. So I think that the, like this intensity component of, yeah, you can, you're going to sweat more as the race is more intense, like the Elliot Kipchoge example, right? He's trying to run a two hour mm -hmm. marathon. That complexity is kind of thrown out the window because everybody's running like endurance or recovery run pace out in training for most of their training. And they're going to do that same intensity during the race. So you actually do have a decent playground to start to figure the, these things out from that perspective. Yeah. But I keep coming back to the, the idea of, are you able to replenish? Right. And so right. during training, the issue is either no, or the issue is yes, but at a lesser rate than I would during a race. And then we get into a race and you have all of this access to fluid uh, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, and that to me becomes the variable that is least accounted for when yeah. you come to a race situation. So I don't know if we can riff on that for a little bit and how to coach an athlete best through that scenario. Yeah. I mean, what do you guys think? Duncan, are you saying in training, you're going to have less access to fluid and then in, on race day, you're going to have more access for, to fluid and how to account for that? Hmm. Correct. Cause I think that's where we're having these issues in, in a race for some people is all of a sudden I'm ingesting twice the amount of fluid and I'm not as cognizant of the sodium level of that fluid that I'm ingesting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, so an example is, uh, you know, over the years in particular this past year or two, I've gotten much more focused on coaching athletes through doing loop training, you know, two hours back to the car, three hour loop back to, you know, whatever, whatever the duration might be so they can resupply in their key training runs. You know, I didn't, I never really worked with athletes in that regard before I would say, yeah, do the cool loop you want to do. And, you know, but now I think it's uh, it's a little more important to be focused on that. So I don't know if anyone else does that. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. You got to do the, the car aid station loop. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then like, what's nice, throw all your wrappers down when you get there, yeah. do some math right then, get a jump start on your nutrition report card. But yeah, you've got to loop it to, to make it simple because you go for your long run in the mountains, maybe that streams out of water, you know, then, then there's too many variables to account for. I do think to, to Duncan's point as a coach, here's where we can kind of come in with our expertise because we realize that there, you not only have this kind of more like social situation, you know, for lack of a better word, where now you have access to aid stations and pacers and, you know, I guess pa pacers, you should only be taking fluid off of them if, if it's Leadville to bring up that race again. But you have this, you have this like social situation where you just have more access to fluid as compared to just the fluid you can kind of carry, carry on your back. And that just presents more opportunities to, to, to take in fluid that you might not need depending upon the temperature range that you're actually in or sodium that you might not need, depending upon how much fluid you need to replace and how much fluid that, um, uh, that, that, that you've lost. And you combine that with what I mentioned earlier is we're, we're, we're working with this equation where it's hard to get the, the variables. So one of the ways that we can kind of come in as coaches is make reasonable estimates. 
And I think one, one of the things we can take from Alan's work is, is that if you make reasonable estimates, you can kind of get it close and at least try to avoid something that is what I would say extremely performance deleterious, like you have like a 10% decline in performance or something like that from the intervention that you give, you always try to avoid those things and, or just catastrophic from a extremely low blood sodium uh, perspective. I do think that you can reasonably do that in most cases, as long as those athletes sweat sodium concentrations aren't on the edges of the bell curve. When you Mm -hmm. have the athletes that are, and I actually, I just had one that, texted me last last night about this. So I'm a little bit hesitant to say everybody fits in this model because they don't. But when you have athletes that are kind of in the middle of that sweat sodium bell curve, you can, there's tolerance there, right? There's tolerance there. And as long as you're not, I think as long as you're not like egregiously overdoing it one way or the other, which has kind of been the, the trend, to be honest with you, your body will mm-hmm. compensate to a certain extent. And it could, we know it can also tolerate losses. You know, we don't know what those are in an ultra marathon setting. It's probably not 2%. It's probably more than that. I don't want to guess it how much more than that, but it's probably, you know, we probably don't need to focus on 2% body water loss as this like magic threshold for a hundred mile ultra marathon that you don't want to exceed because there's going to be more body mass losses that aren't associated with like the functional hyd- hydration piece of things. But I guess my point with that is, is, is for a lot of people that are kind of hitting in the middle of the bell curve, you can, even if you don't have access to lab equipment, to a wearable and things like that, you can get it reasonably close and your body can kind of like compensate for, for some of the tolerance, as long as you're not epically screwing it up. Yeah. I like at calories as a, as an example of that. I know we're not talking calories today, but you know, if we avoid the extremes, generally we know what works. So if, if an athlete's not going out in a completely facet state and running in a facet state, that's an extreme that's going to cause issues. If an athlete has no practice with GI tolerance is trying to get four to 500 calories per hour, that becomes an issue. So at that middle spot, if an athlete is attempting to get 250 calories per hour, 300 calories, maybe per hour, they're probably going to be doing okay. And I think the same with sodium you know, as long as they're not going zero, as long as they have an awareness that they need some sodium per unit of, of fluid, we're going to hit most problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, cause here's the other thing, right? Like I've seen a lot of athletes do this, uh, both sweat sodium testing and sweat, uh, rate loss testing in like environmental chambers. Right. So you go in just like we're, we, we were discussing, you know, with a stupid, uh, example with a bike, you can do it on a treadmill in another format and use, you know, absorbent patches and squeeze the sweat out of the patch. They use that in like team sports and stuff like that. You can do that. But I think one, in ultra marathon, especially, especially for re- races like Western States and, uh, uh, bad water, if you go through a heat training intervention, using sauna or hot water bath that changes. Or if you just start training in the heat, right? We know Mm -hmm. that your sweat rate changes at any temperature range. And also the composition, uh, the electrolyte composition of that sweat can change as well at those, you know, at whatever output that you're, um, uh, that, that you're actually performing in. And so you might actually be trying to get as precise as possible But if you're going to go through a heat training intervention, once again, this is where coaching comes in. You have to realize how that is malleable, right? How that's going to adapt these previous equations that you have, or these previous loss rates that you have are going to adapt after you have gone through that intervention. Cause that's kind of the point of some of the interventions is to sweat earlier and to sweat more. And so if you're underneath that condition and you're working with kind of like previous variables, once again, this is another thing that, that, that kind of complicates it, that, that, that makes it, that makes it extremely difficult. So anyway, I, I, I just thought of that and I thought I would, I thought I would bring it up because there are a lot of athletes that want to get this dialed in. I don't think now's the time to dial it in. I think it's kind of like closer to the race once you've gone through all of your training, because even training can do that, to be honest with you. Um, once you've gone through all your training to really, to really, really get it close. Go ahead, Fred. I was going to say about what you were saying right now. Like before, when you were saying about the, uh, you, you have to test almost quarterly. Like my thought was like, whenever I've done this or asked someone to do it was always close to the competition because this is actually when it is relevant. Like a more or less, I don't care what is your sweat rate right now. Like if you want to know it for the sake of curiosity or because you want to like be on top of your hydration 
throughout the day and like, no, though I lost this much water, I should drink more or less during the day because I'm feeling sluggish or something like that. Then absolutely yes, but like for performance purposes, yes, that. And then also like if you're doing any kind of heat training intervention, what matters is, and basically what really matters is what is your sweat rate on race day. Right. So you want to measure as close to that. Like you cannot measure it on race day. You can probably not do it the day before. Maybe you can do it a week before, but not before, not a month before when you're going to do your last three interventions trying to target that one race. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that's a money uh, piece of advice there, Fred, is you want to know your sweat rate on race day in, in and I'll add in, in those conditions that the race day is actually going to actually going to present. You can do all the testing that you want, like, you know, pre, it's not like a, it's not like we do like physiological testing, right? So we do lactate threshold, VO2 max testing, or do a field testing or whatever. You can try to orchestrate those like once a quarter, depending upon, you know, the, the, the athlete. It's not like that because you're not marking like quote unquote progress, right? You kind of, you really don't really care about this except for the race. Yeah, you care about it in training, but those sessions, as we discussed earlier, are rel- are most of the time shorter. And so the the pressure right that like ergogenic pressure right of getting this right is just less in that type of uh uh, in that type of training situation as opposed to the race yeah and then like your body through the thirst mechanism really it will self-regulate so like for tomorrow's session like if you were thirstier at the end of the race or more dehydrated you will have drunk more you're not going to get chronically dehydrated like more and more dehydrated if you're drinking less because you will just be a bit more thirsty yeah so then from day to day it's not as important it is that what you were saying like close to competition yeah i still come come back to the theme is is you can use thirst to up to a few hours because once again <laughs> it almost doesn't matter at that point right i mean not that it doesn't matter but like you've got taller your, your body has enough reserves mm-hmm. to to tolerate things but after that and especially in extreme environments cold altitude heat kind of whatever ultra marathons kind of serve mm-hmm. up your your mechanism for thirst just you know gets foobarred. I was going to throw in the real f word there, but I held myself back. Mm-hmm. It just gets foobarred because it, because of all of these different kind of all of these different factors, and so you can use it as an in, as an indicator, but not as the sole indicator. I kind of is mm-hmm. what what I come back to. But I do like like I do like this paper a lot because it's like um, the conversation that we're having because it's giving us two sides of things. Like the, this is very complicated, and there are so many variables that we don't know. And then on the slides that uh, that you got from the podcast yesterday, like there is this one, uh, like there's a decision tree, which yes. I really like how it simplifies yes. it. Because like for like out of one, two, three, four, six options, four of them are season to taste, right? So it's like, <laughs> it's very complicated, but like doesn't matter that much unless it's in these two specific scenarios. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, which is like at the very extreme. Yeah. Of it, which I love it. It's like, oh, like this thing that looks so complicated, like we can probably summarize it and look at it in this way. I agree. But when you go down to the decision tree, pretty much every ultra marathon is going to end up in the lower left hand corner where you have to make that yeah. complicated decision. And almost every piece of training is going to end up on the right hand side where it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. That it that now that I'm thinking about it, Fred, that mm-hmm. there you go. That's why it's so complicated. It, it, it's related to my earlier point is, is you're doing something different in racing than you are in training, or at least the the, the decision tree is telling you to do something different in a race scenario as, as compared to a, a training scenario for, for almost all of them. And you don't get a chance to like, you know, it, or at least yeah, the yeah. pressure, the ergogenic pressure, as I mentioned earlier, isn't there in a training scenario to get all those things right. And then... You asked that question about like, can we know by like the sweat or like the salt, yeah. how salty is your t-shirt after like, can you know one? Like, it's like, we cannot know, but I, I kept wondering, like, is there anything that can tell me this? Like, it's not going to give you a concentration, but are you like either medium high? Because basically if I remember correctly, it's like everyone that is average would be in the season to taste one. Yeah. And then like, it would be only those that are above average. So like, do you tend to be a, uh, I, I keep wondering, is there going to be something? I know that there's at least one hydration company that claims to tell you with a test and then they send you one of yeah. the batch tests as well, as well. But like they, there's one that has a questioner. I have no idea how good that questioner is. And of course, they didn't provide any validation for it. Yeah, that's... But, oh, go ahead, Red. Sorry. Keep going. No, no, but that like, it's like, can we know? Can we get a 
an idea or actually can we learn that from experience? Like, can you do one of those long runs in like one way and the other? And then from that, try to guesstimate if you're a salty sweater or not. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things. It's still a dice roll. You can probably get mm -hmm. it right the majority of the time just from those observations. The scientific community would poo-poo on that because you're getting yeah. like seven out of 10 people instead of nine or 10 out of 10 people. But the company that you mentioned, I had him on my podcast earlier, is mm -hmm. Andy Blow with Precision Hydration. Sorry. And they will use they, they will use sweat testing in, in like a resting setting, right? So they'll draw mm -hmm. the sweat out of the uh, uh, gland electrically and, and, and analyze and tell you what your electrolyte composition is uh, based off of that. And then they put you into a high, medium, low kind of category. And I, I just happen to have one on my desk right here. Uh, yeah. And I, I use this product. I've had athletes that, that, that use that product. I think that my opinion is that I think that that's a decent level of granularity to go about it. And, but you have to understand that, sorry, let me, let me kind of back up a little bit. So Fred, your, um, um, your statement about they use a questionnaire, they're doing that as a surrogate for the actual mm -hmm. sweat, for the actual sweat testing. So actually looking at the sweat, determining the electrolyte composition and things like that. And what they're doing is, is they're taking this observational piece that they've seen and they have a thousands of tests like this they're taking those tests and comparing it to those those athletes observations and designing a questionnaire for people who don't have access to this type of test because it's a big machine you know it's the size of a oh, yeah I'm looking at my soundboard here. Nobody actually knows what it actually looks like, but it's you know, the size of a big laptop. If you want to think about it mm -hmm. like that. And it's not, my point with that is, is, is you can't just go to Best Buy and go find it, right? You have to find somebody who has one of these machines and go and get the test or they've got to come to you or whatever. So in lieu of that, based on all the tests they have and all the observations that they've made, they've designed this questionnaire, which probably gets it close and they'd be transparent about this. I've mm. always found them to be very open and honest about what they can do and what they can't do in my interactions with them, but it'll probably get it close for most people who have an honest assertion of their themselves, which, you know, you can say, you, we can some, people don't know. <laughs> I, some people I, don't I know. Test it, right? I don't even know how to answer it half yeah. the time. Like I've taken it numerous times. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't know, or it might be different. You might like, because it's your observation, right. And your yeah. biases are going to go into it. It might be one thing one day and another thing the other day. But I guess my point with that is, is dividing it up into this like high, medium, low piece. I, I think that that's a reasonable degree of granularity. I think if you get any more granular than that, like you're trying to find an electrolyte replacement beverage that's like within, you know, five millimoles per liter or something like that, it just kind of misses the point because the, the other inputs that you have to use our earlier example, right? don't aren't going to lead to that quite of a precise of an, uh, uh, of an answer. So I don't know. I, I think, I think even with that though, like one of the things that you can kind of take, take away, I keep coming back to this is your body has a lot of tolerance and we don't need to replace everything. Not even close. We've been using that 70% threshold in a lot of cases to stay above this 2% body water loss. And I do think that a lot of athletes have taken that as they need to replace 98% of their body water loss starting at ounce one. And that's just not the case, right? You don't need to, it's, it's the total that you need to realize over long periods of time. And you might not even get to 98, 97% of your initial starting uh, body weight for a two or three hour run, you know? And that's not to say that taking in fluids is bad, right? Especially at those, at, the, at, at those levels, but it's just not, I don't think it's, er, I don't think it's uh, extremely ergogenic nor even necessary. Well, and I, one thing I really liked about Alan's work that pulls this out, you know, if, if you look at both extremes, the saltiest of sweaters, and the least saltiest of sweaters along, what's the graph you put up? It said, how much sodium do I need? Yeah, yep. Right, so you have your like 80 millimole, those are your saltiest yep. sweaters, your 20 millimole, the least saltiest. So like you're looking at the extremes of the bell curve, even if your saltiest sweaters are able to replace 90% of their fluid, like help me make sure I'm reading this chart right, because he's that's that would be 84% 
of sodium losses required to maintain your stable sodium plasma levels. Right. 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 Yep. And, and the least of salty sweaters are, even if they replaced 90% of their loss, they're at 38%. Yep. Right. Like it's just, I think it just gives people a lot of like grace that there's, yeah, yeah. It's not as extreme and as precise. Yeah. Well, and one of, one of the things that's kind of led to this and I, Nicole, what, what you're kind of getting at is, is there, there does tend to be a, uh, uh, kind of like a culture I mean, and I picked that word very deliberately, a culture of o- over sodium supplementation. Mm-hmm. And those of us that have been in the ultra running game for a long period of time, we've seen this transition to where people would down those salt pill, down salt pills. They would be on, you know, you would have uh, races that uh, had sponsors, right. With, uh, uh, with sodium pills. And they just have every aid station, just a little bowl of them. People would just take them out by the fistful and we, and eat them like chiclets. Um, but we've, we, we have had a culture of over sodium supplementation that has kind of gradually gotten course corrected, um, uh, uh, over the years. And that can be problematic. I mean, we initially started to recognize this just from a medical perspective, right? Where people were just coming in with just, you know, they were bloated and just had way too much, uh, uh, sodium on, on, on board because of this. And so I think to your point, Nicole, I hope something that something that people take away is, yeah, you do have a little bit of grace. You don't need to take in a salt pill every single hour, nor is the time dependency piece of the the biggest thing that you need to the, the, that you need to that you need to worry about. And interestingly enough, I still think and this is showing my disdain for exogenous sodium supplementation. <laughs> I still think that that's the recommended use on most of those bottles. Do you guys know? Like the, and what I mean by that is, is take one of these for every X unit of time. It, when you yeah, see, when you see the direction not per volume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's, I, I've said that for years. Duncan, back me up yeah. on this. You've known me the longest yeah, no, in this group. I, I agree. I mean, that, that is uh, one of the biggest takeaways. It's not per unit time. It's per unit fluid volume consumed. Yeah. And there, if, you're, if you're going to look at it that way, yeah. I'll leave the door open that there may be some time dependency on it, but it's certainly not the heavier mm-hmm. hitters in the room. It's certainly not mm-hmm. the main ones. The main ones are going to be how much fluid are you losing? How much are you taking in? What's the composition of those two things, right? That's what we've been, that's what we've been talking about. And it has always befuddled me and I bang my freaking head on the table when I see that recommendation, because what it's really doing, they're just trying to sell more pills, right? Because they're trying to sell it per unit right. time. So if people go out for a two hour run, they expect people to take two, two salt pills. That's, I mean, that's, there, there's no other, there's no other, in my opinion, there's no other logical origin of that recommendation and stamping it on because they could do whatever they want to the supplement industry right they can, they can right. put whatever they want to on their labels so they're choosing to do it as a time dependency and essentially to 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 to, to get consumers to 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 consume more of them or to get athletes to consume well, i would more say to give them the benefit of the doubt i would say it they may be also just trying to simplify it for the consumer yeah, okay. where if, if we're already saying x amount of calories per hour x amount of water per hour okay x amount of salt tabs per hour you know maybe it's just a simplistic thing but I don't, I don't know. It causes problems. Causes problems. I don't know. I think that's di- disingenuous because the consumer sh- should be smarter than that. Right. Yeah, actually, I think that taking into account that most cyclists use basically half a liter bottles and so soft flasks, flasks are actually half a liter bottles. Yeah. Like the calculation would not be like it's one every two bottles if it's one per liter or like one every yeah. four bottles if it's one per two liter. So. Oh, no. so. oh, Duncan just sees the best in everyone. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, I mean, I work Everyone for, has good motives. I, I, co- I coach people that sell these, that sell these sodium supplement products. Right. And they're going to listen to this and throw an egg at me or cancel me or something <laughs> like that. So I mean, I, if anybody wants to come on my podcast and explain that to me or just do it privately, like you're more than welcome to, but I've always had an issue with that. But the take home message just kind of drive this back to the athletes. I think the take, the take home message here is, is when you're thinking about your sodium supplementation, you should think about it across these three variables and not necessarily, and certainly not predominantly, and maybe not at all, across a time variable and more than anything else that just messes with people 
because they're used to doing everything else by time. When am I going to get to the next aid station? When do I get my next gel? When, right, being the key, the key word there, am I going to do X, Y, or Z? And this, the when is not the determining factor, right? There's other things kind of like coming into play. And I just think that that switch, a lot Mm -hmm. of people just, they just can't, like for whatever reason, like get out of that ingrained thought. Because it's easy. It's easy that way. Yeah, you want it to be easy. I know. <laughs> you don't have to do math while running. I know. When it, whenever, um, uh, whenever I've had to explain this at our camps, so uh, D- Duncan will know this as we kind of go through this nutrition talk and we bring it a- along four points, calories, fluid, and sodium. And calories and fluid are always per unit time, right? X amount of calories for this amount for an hour. X amount of fluid, and it's a big range, it's like double, right? To go on our earlier point, per time. And then when I get to the sodium piece, I present it in per unit of fluid volume that you are taking in, right? And I always have to be very deliberate and slow and make sure that I'm emphasizing how I'm describing the units with that Mm -hmm. because you've gone through two, maybe you should flip this around to be honest with you. Cause I've always gone from easiest to most complex. Maybe I should just flip it around just to like start out with the hard one or whatever. But, but anyway, my point with that is, is just based on experience. If I don't do that, people will just like ignore the units and just think that, and just assume that it's per unit time. And I've had people go out on a, a run and say, Hey, I took in, 500 milligrams per hour. I hit, you know, I hit the range exactly as you told me to. And I was, I'm like, no, wait a minute. Like you totally missed it. I did not explain this correctly (laughs) because it's not per hour. But at the same time, when you're explaining that really what you're saying is like liquid is per hour. Yeah. And then this is per liquid. So then like in the end, it's a multiplication of one thing and the other. So like if they are strict with the liquid, if they should get right, right? Yeah. But then like if something changes with the liquid, then like, or if they are not using the same part of the range, like the top range or the bottom of the range. Yeah. yeah. So what, what we do at our camps is, is just a, an exercise that Ryan uh, described earlier is we have everybody go out. They keep their trash. Not that they would like throw it out on the trails anywhere, but they're very <laughs> deliberate about like keeping all their trash and we dump their trash on a table and we just log it. And the, the hardest part of all of that is this is how much fluid I consumed. And this is the sodium from all of those things, all of the gels, the rice balls, the crackers and cookies and sandwiches and the electrolyte actually in the drink itself. And then we divide that by the total amount of fluid that was consumed, whether that fluid was from an electrolyte drink or from water or from even like a, like a Coke or something like that. And you can argue how that changes, you know, the composition of everything, but we're just trying to get kind of a fundamental, uh, uh, basis point overview. Yeah. And the range that we're trying to get in is 600 to 800 milliliters of sodium per liter of fluid. And once again, it's a split the middle difference, right? And we're not saying that you have to replace 100% of that. We're just saying that the rate of ingestion, as long as you're mm-hmm. getting the rate, uh, as long as you're matching that correctly with the rate of mm-hmm. output, not one-to-one correctly with the rate of output, that's going to keep you in the right serum sodium range. If you're, if you're doing that, especially over long, like long periods of time. Now this might add a little bit of a nuance to it where maybe it's not that high. Maybe it's 500 milliliters per or 500 milligrams per liter or something like that. 300. But, but the point is, is you've got to kind of like get it reasonable, especially when you're looking at, at long duration activities. Okay. We're going to wrap it up. I want to hear Duncan just left. He like quit. (laughs) (laughs) What happened to Duncan? He's mad at me. Can I say something else though? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah. 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 So there is one thing that like, we have been looking at all of these variables and then one thing that you have been mentioning a lot is like, how cool is the tolerance of the body for the different ranges? Right. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I looked at in the paper, like, well, I, I built a calculator. So like I built the model in Excel and then like one thing that I was seeing when I was doing is that what it is trying to do is always keeping the sodium, the plasma sodium concentration at 140. Mm-hmm. And this yep. one thing that you said in the, in the other audio file that is like, do we know if the optimum is like 140 right. or is it 135 or 150? Especially what I was wondering is cause I don't know what else, the normal range. I know that 140 is right in the middle yeah. because it's what Alan said on the other 
audio, but it's like, yeah, like what is the range? Because even then, like what is the tolerance that we have? Because I have my calculator and it's like, well, if I actually want to get it instead of 140, if I want to get it to as low as 125, how much more, or how much less do I have to take? Or like how, how much more can I take and it not be a problem because I will not be above range? Or how much less can I take and it not be a problem because I will still not be. So I I will look at that and I'll try to make that calculator. Actually, I will maybe even try to convert it to ounces if I. Oh man, do dude, okay. wait for, for, do you okay. doing all the Americans a favor now? Fred's in Spain no, right like, now for the uh, listeners. I, 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 st- <laughs> I started, I started making it and I, I, I started making it because I wanted to understand the model. And then it was like, well, yeah, I could probably share this with everyone. I, I will have to make it pretty because right now I don't know if anyone yeah. Understand it. I but mean, like, can I create a calculator that we can all have and then say, like, okay, yeah, so then is it going to be a problem or not? What is the acceptable range that we have? Like, what should I give my athlete or tell yeah. my athlete to do? Do it. I mean, we pass that around the coaching department. If we can make it mm-hmm. public in some format, I could do it on my, you know, website and mm-hmm. we can kind of cross reference it with Alan, get some sign off there. I think that'd be yeah, great. Exactly. Like, make sure like, he can check all of my calculations so I didn't screw it up. Yeah. But, so far, uh, the numbers are the same ones that he has on the paper. So. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I want I wanted to you, you gave me a good lead in here, right? Because uh, I wanted to wrap off wrap up with like one thing you either learned or you're going to do differently or was reemphasized to you. Um, and, and mine was just that, Fred. Is the is that most likely when we're thinking about what most likely when we're thinking about serum sodium concentration, which is just what you mentioned, right? How are we going to keep it in the right range? There's probably not an ergogenic, like optimal range, like optimal way to do it. If you're within this range, it's potato, potato, you go outside of it. And we know that there are complications, right? We have to send people to the hospital, you know, blah, 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 all those other things, but within there at, at the very most, we're not certain. And you know, who knows 10 or 15 years now, this might be proven wrong, but I honestly don't think that, one way or the other, it's going to matter all that, all that much. I do think that there's obviously a critical, there are critical levels there that we need to, that we need to watch out for, but who knows? That was one thing that was reemphasized to me is that we're talking about all of this and we're still not sure if there is an ergogenically optimal level of sodium, sodium, uh, serum sodium. And if there is, what is it? Is it 140, right? We're kind of picking this from a medical perspective in terms of how to prevent c- catastrophe, but a lot of times in sports, we're trying to optimize it. So anyway, that was one thing that was reemphasized to me that I brought up with Alan. He kind of gave the same answer. as like, we don't know. So uh, we'll go around the room. Duncan, you get to go first since you're on the left-hand side of my screen. I'm going to go clockwise. Yeah. That means, Nicole, you're next. Uh, so you can prepare your thoughts as as uh, uh, and get them ready. So, Duncan, what, what did you either learn or are you going to kind of like do differently or reemphasize with your athletes? Yeah, big reemphasis is, again, just on the importance of uh, over the course of a year or six-month window or, or build up, getting more runs greater than four hours. Mm. getting more runs greater than four hours with fluid replacement as an option or as a, as a more uh, significant option. And then attempting to get in sodium, you know, this is something we talk about all the time, but Hey, sodium is important, but it's per unit of fluid uh, volume, not per unit of time, really hitting that home, I think uh, is important. And then just getting athletes into a range of environmental conditions, you know, I think, I think of myself as an anecdote, you know, I run at 6 a.m. every morning in the summer in Gunnison. It's 41.3 degrees when I start. It's 57.6 degrees when I end every morning. No rain, no humidity. It's always the same. I'm not out of my comfort zone enough. And so I think that's important for athletes to, to run at different times of the day if they can run longer when they can and replenish more when they can. Yeah. Very dynamic, right? Going back to our earlier yeah. point like that, the, yeah. the fluid losses are extreme, way more dynamic than most people appreciate when you go up and down that temperature gradient. All right, Nicole. Yeah. I think this really drives home the importance of uh, developing your hydration status first or your hydration strategy first, yeah. right? That, you know, we can like, really dial in on the nitty gritty of my milligrams per so- of sodium. But like, before you even do that, like you have to <laughs> understand your sweat 
rate, right? And understand under a variety of conditions, like Duncan said, you have to have your hydration plan in place and experiment with that through your training. And then the calories follow and then sodium intake follows, right? And we can easily correct if we get into a hole um, caloric wise, yeah. it doesn't take that long. You can easily correct if you do get into a hole, if you get behind on sodium, we can do that quickly. If you get behind on hydration, that takes hours to correct. And so figure that out first. Um, and then the rest will follow, right? Like that has to be the piece that's, that's really critical. I think one other piece that's worth taking home is I came away with this feeling like, you know, most athletic populations don't need to worry about sodium. I think ultra runners, like this is a good use case for doing a sweat test, like yeah. using the patch. Like I, I do, like I used to th tell athletes, maybe that's not as important, but I think for a lot of people, there's a benefit there in knowing your sodium loss. I, so, yeah, I, I think that this, and this is something I told Meredith when I, Meredith is CEO of Nick's, um, when, when I saw her at the running event, it's like, you're going to have a lot of team sports athletes that want this it's probably not very useful for them. I hate to tell you that because it's a huge market for your business, <laughs> but you know, when you go out and you're practicing, you're in the weight room for an hour, probably not that important. And it, at the very most, like even, even you take, uh, Alan brought up this, uh, example in the, uh, in, in the podcast In some sports, there's just no opportunity. You've got a soccer match yeah. and you're out there for 90 minutes you can't like go to the sideline and, you know, start to rehydrate. So anyway, so the, so even if you did know it, it's like, okay, your intervention is now limited to halftime, right? Or whenever that break is quarters in a basketball game or periods in a hockey match or something like that. So anyway, that Nicole, that, that, that point is, is, is really, really well taken of ultra marathon might be the best. And in some cases, maybe the only kind of use case for this, just because of the duration of our activities are so long, right? Certainly Ironman and some stage race cycling gets it gets into this area as well. But it's certain ultra ultra is certainly the best one because we see the whole range from training to racing that can be just an hour to days. <laughs> right. All right, Ryan. Uh reemphasized of just keep it simple and you're always practicing this. You're not going to hit the extreme temperatures of race day in your training runs. So be prepared, yeah. have an empty soft flask on you so you can fill up that extra bottle, take the bladder, um, just, just be prepared and slow down. Like I think, yeah, practice it in training. And then on race day, like, Oh yeah, it's going to be pretty hot. It's going to be, mid eighties, upper eighties. I never ran in that. So I don't know how much more I'm going to drink, but I'm going to be capable rather than being that person that is parched and people are passing like, do you have any water on you? Mm -hmm. Like just be prepared, yep. be prepared and slow down. So you can, so you can compensate for temperatures going up, my body needs more research sources to thermoregulate. So I need to slow down to counteract that. We have one of our coaches, he wrote an article about this on our blog that, that screwed up that extrapolation and got heat stroke, right? Cliff. Oh, yeah. And, and I'll, I'll link up that, I'll link up, uh, uh, I'll put the link to that blog in, in the, in the show notes as well. But I think it goes to demonstrate that e even when you're trying to make that extrapolation, it's still hard and it's easy to lose in kind of like the field of battle, so to speak with all these other things going on. I, I do think Ryan, to your point, that extrapolation of your training conditions to your race conditions, when you don't have the opportunity or don't create the opportunity to actually experience it, that is one of the trickiest things about this. And when you're working with normal athletes that don't travel all around the world to their race venues and stuff like that, that happens a lot. And it's just a reality that we have to recognize. And I think all of us, including me, can do a much better job of paying attention to that extrapolation and making it a point in training. And then also when we're coming up with the race plans. All right, Fred, you're next. I would say my takeaway is that we should like practice and measure and then create a strategy. Ryan said strategy. before something like 
we don't want to be doing math while running, which is absolutely <laughs> true, especially like at hour 15 of an ultra marathon, like during the night or in the middle of the day. So like do that math beforehand or like either you or your coach or whatever it is. So like practice it, measure it, what you were saying before about dumping everything, all the wrappers on the table and knowing what it is and then knowing like, having like this strategy, like, okay, like if it is this hot, then I will have to drink more. And then like, this means like this much more sodium and like having some that like simple rules on your strategy, that is like a, a flexible strategy that will help you on race day. Yeah. You know, I struggle with that a lot because I want to get the race day strategy as precise as possible, but I realize that there's, there, there has to be some sort of flexibility because you're not perfect at predicting things. I kind of give myself like a 90% rule. Like if we can get it 90% there and then take 90% of the thinking out of it, I'm I, like, I'm good with that. And I've seen yeah. that work out with athletes where it's like, you know, they come in and they have like one more gel in their pack. Like, okay, like you had eight gels and you took seven instead of eight. I'm kind of okay with that. That's not exactly 90%. I know that, but like, I'm kind of, I'm kind of okay with that. You know, like you, you leave with three flasks and there's just a little bit left in the third one when they come back in. I, like, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think we've got that, like, mm -hmm. we, we've got that close. And the close. bigger advantage, to your point, Fred, is just not doing the math and not thinking about it. Because I tell you what, that's energy. Like, the, the that is absolute, that absolutely is a cost when you're out on a race course and you're trying to maximize performance. It's just like putting on an extra couple kilograms or, dragging a rock behind you or, you know, kind of mm -hmm. however else you can think about handicapping yourself, having to think a lot is absolutely a, a performance detriment. And, and the more that we can plan for it in advance to take the thinking out of it, that will, that enables our athletes more. Crews can do that as well, right? We're going to take the thinking out of it, yeah. out of it. Just take everything that we give you, trust us. <laughs> That's a big part of it. Trust us and then, then go. And uh, that it, I've, I've seen that play out in so many different, so many different situations where the athletes who just aren't thinking they're going to typically overperform because they've taken that burden off of themselves. Awesome folks. Thanks. Thanks for being the guinea pigs. Thanks. That was good. I didn't even use my calculator. I'm disappointed. <laughs> yeah. I kind of bummed. Next. I am like craving something salty though. We've got to go get a snack. <laughs> Next time. Next time we will do it. <laughs> All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Alan for coming back on the podcast. Links to his work as well as Next Level Nutrition, as well as his podcast, The Long Munch. Go and check it out. He just had a fantastic conversation with one of the legends in endurance, Asker Jukendrup, and that one will absolutely blow your mind. Thank you to the coaches for coming together for a round table and a little bit of an experimental format to try to make sense out of it all. Let me know what you thought about this podcast. As I mentioned during the intro, it is a little bit of a different format and that different format is driven by a lot of the feedback that I have gotten in the community that they want to hear more from our coaches and more about how we take some of this research and bring it to our athletes in a very practical way, what we are doing day to day with our athletes so that you all, you all the audience can learn how to better inform your training. So let me know what you think. I can do anything with this podcast. I can make it an hour. I can make it three hours. I can make it 20 minutes if I want to. That is one of the great things about not trying to monetize it, not taking on any sponsors is I can be malleable and do whatever I want because I don't care if it drives a hundred eyeballs or a hundred thousand eyeballs. All I care is that you all enjoy the product and are informed by the end product that is produced once it hits your ears. So let me know what you think. As always, you guys, I appreciate the heck out of each and every one of you. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.